has traveled from a galaxy far beyond our own. He is a hundred thousand years ahead of us. He has powers we cannot comprehend. And he is about to face the one force in the universe he is yet to conquer. Podcasts! Uh, what's the real? Uh, love, love, uh, love. Pers- love. Love. Not kissing? He does conquer kissing. Uh, can I read the other taglines for this movie? Because they're fucking good. You can. They're they're good. Or I guess there's just one other. The, the other two posters have the other tagline, which is, In 1977, Voyager 2 was launched into space, inviting all life forms in the universe to visit our planet. Get ready. Company's coming. Like that makes it sound like a much wackier movie, right? That makes right. That makes it sound like a, a weird family is en route or whatever. Like, uh, get ready for Star Man and Star Wife and Star Child. Yeah, right. Well, like, th- so there are two posters that have that tagline. One of them is like them holding hands and the star in their hand, and the other one is sort of the classic teaser poster where it is just John Carpenter Star Man. The logo is the falling comet. And then the sort of like, uh, I don't know, the night sky, the, the house off in the distance. With the one house with the lights on. It, right. It's snazzy. It's a fairly it's snazzy it's poster. Good. It's a compelling image, right? They had a good, they had a good little, um, you know, like you said, the Comet logos. That's pretty, that's pretty snazzy. It's good. It's I don't good. Know. I do, but it does feel like they're straining a little bit to explain what, what's good, what to be excited for, right? Right, it's, I think we're going to talk about it. The yeah. one that read that I read, I think, is good. I think does a good job of that, but it, it also does. looks like they took the the iconography of the other poster and they just kind of like poorly photoshopped in Bridges and Allen because they needed to put some faces on the poster. Like they want to show the hotties. They don't look great, although they are hotties. And They're we hotties. Do, we do have to acknowledge that, and I am looking respectfully, but um, you know. Also, the the blues, the lights, the E.T. comparison is right there. E.T. also has, you know, this this movie is just, it's just struggling to be like, well, this one's about love. It's about like grown up love. You know, it's, that's what I feel like they're trying to do. Trying to get out of the E.T. shadow. Yes. Um, the, uh, whatchamacallit, the image that has been used for most home video releases of the movie or at least modern home video releases like the dvd and the blu-ray is so aggressively bad where it's like just a jeff bridges head head shot but then there's like red lines going through his face and it has a logo that makes it look like it's a glenn larson tv show and then there's sort of a silhouette of him running out of the fire like it makes it look like such a junky it it looks like even six million dollar man or whatever yes yes Sure. Like even with the title too, it just seems like a bootleg almost like a yes, bad yeah. translation of another movie. <laughs> My Blu-ray has Griff. I don't know if you have this Blu-ray, but you know, it's just like a sort of silhouette and he's in front of a planet. Uh, right. That's this the Shout one? Factory one. Right? Yeah. Which is yeah. a little better, although still like a little dorky looking, but you know, yeah. it's fine. It's a dorky movie. In he's... that in that Blu-ray one, he's got this smirk on his face that like yeah. makes it look like he like set the fire that he's walking. Uh, <laughs> yes, Karen it does. He looks yes. a little malevolent is what you Yes. You know, it, yes, it's kind of indicative of his performance, which we'll talk about. Where like that is kind of a face he would make in the movie, but it makes no sense in the context of this bad Blu-ray poster. Well, it, the red makes no sense. Red yeah. is not really a color in this movie. It, no. It's very. It's like an American flag kind of vibe. It's weird. You say that, David, but you're in front of a bright red background from this. Movie. That's true. Well, that's that's true. Right at the end. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. But well, it's a lot of blue. But yeah, yeah, you're no, right. Blue. You're right. Blue. You're right. He's got blue. that red hat. He's got that hat. He does have that red hat. He wants to make America great again. He wants red, to make Earth oh, great no. again. Red oh, car. No. He, do, he does want to make America and Earth great again for the right reasons. We're talking about the star, man. That's who we're talking about because this is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. Fast. Jumped in there. Lightning fast. I, I'm David. I'm trying to do Jeff Bridges in this movie. I'm I, David. And I am David. I am David. I am David. It's like the yeah, you gotta really enunciate. Yeah, you his gotta mouth, chew on those words, and his mouth moves too much when he's speaking. It's yeah. like right, it's like he's talking, but his tongue isn't moving somehow. It's just his <laughs> yeah. just his lips are moving over his teeth or whatever. Yeah, it's the exact opposite of like modern Billy Goat Gruff Jeff Bridges, where every line sounds like he's chewing on a tin can. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're under arrest. Uh, yes. Um, it is, it, what a guy. What he's a guy. still out there. I guess he hasn't made a movie in a few years, but he's still out he's, there. He's been, he's been fighting cancer, unfortunately. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, David, way, last... to, way to bring the mood down. Way to bring the Sorry, mood down. I know. Yeah. The you last... want to come in and drag Jeff Bridges for taking some time off from work in order to take care of his health. I'm not dragging him. Dragging I, I'm him just happy name. he's still. I mean, his last uh, performance was Bad Times at the El Royale, mm -hmm. which he's great in. Great. Yeah. He's, he's really good in. Correct. And, you know, that was just a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Bridges. He's just still yeah. giving us, you know. He'll come back. Anyway. I, I believe in him. He was also working so much. He was in uh, four. Well, no, I guess it's three movies in 2017. And then a documentary where he did the narration. I mean, he no, was working he, a yeah, lot. Yeah, he, for... he was putting in the post Iron Man. And then obviously he wins the Oscar right after run there where he the grizzled bridges run is like a good solid 10 years. Well, he has that amazing moment in 2010 where, like, Jeff Bridges in the fourth decade of movie stardom suddenly has the number one and two movie at the box office over Christmas. Like, he's like Mr. Blockbuster. And everyone was like, wow, Jeff Bridges has got, like, the elder statesman role in Tron Legacy. And then it's like, he's the thing that everyone likes in Tron Legacy. And then True Grit outgrosses Tron Legacy. Yeah, True Grit makes, like, $150 million. 170 Crazy. It fucking cleaned up. That <laughs> movie incredible. is so fucking good. So good. I've seen it five times. It's better every time. It's one of those movies where it's just, if any other director had made it, it might be one of their best movies. The Coens made it, and you're like, is it top five for them? I'm not even sure. No. You know, like, and it's, 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 it's so, good. so good, but we're not but here you, to talk about it. Do you just remember that moment? Like, fucking Tron Legacy is like so hyped up, so expensive. And then instead, it gets fucking suplexed at the box office by a different Bridges. <laughs> two good movies. Well, it has two Bridges is in Tron Legacy, and then the third Bridges comes in to sweep it all under the table. There are three Bridges at the top two of the box office <laughs> in December 2010. Um, we didn't yes. know how good we had it. Then, then he had a run, obviously, of like R.I.P.D. and The Giver and Seventh Son and like all these kind of like failed blockbuster cash and movies and then he fucking comes back with hell or high water and everyone's like oh right our favorite actor have another oscar nom yeah, have another one casually another one S six or seven how many is he up to at this point i think he has one, two, three. i got it pulled up seven seven this nominations and one win yeah. his third right it's his third and it's 10 plus years into his career yeah. And it's the one where he's like, I finally felt like I belonged in Hollywood. And I'm like, oh, nom three is where you really <laughs> yeah. settled down. Child of, of uh, I was talking about Bridges. Lloyd Bridges didn't make it happen. Yeah. He's was, like, I was Lloyd Bridges's kid. Like, yeah. I, 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 I was in my head about that. But like, that's why I was a success. Right? right. It was like, I was a handsome kid and I was given shots because my dad put me on the TV shows and I don't really know if I'm actually good or it's just like. Uh, I man, I don't know. Didn't he reference like Sea Hunt in his Oscar speech? Like, I remember him yes. making the joke about being on that show a lot in that yes. Oscar season. Yes, he definitely sea hunt. did. Yes. Um, I should mention this is a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers or given a series of blank checks, make whatever crazy passion products they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they uh, crash in a hollow comet, baby. This is a mini series on the films of John Carpenter. We're talking Starman, John Carpenter's Starman, yet another movie that is marketed as John Carpenter's blank. It is crazy how early that became a thing in his career and how long it retained. Yeah, I think we say on the Escape from New York episode that that was the first time, and it's the third time. Like, wow. right. yeah, Halloween is the first time. Anyway. The thing I just vividly remember is that uh, Escape from New York has it in the opening credits. Like, that's the title yeah. card, no, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Starman definitely has that, too. It does. It's his, it becomes his brand. And it's the font. Like, it's the same font as all the other ones, right? Yeah. Uh, and there's, like, the uh, anecdote that's interesting that uh, our, our researchers, uh, JJ and Nick, pulled up that they were, like, worried about putting John Carpenter's before this movie because they thought it would give people the wrong idea, that they would think it was too much of a horror movie or an action movie or what have you. And they did market research, and overwhelmingly people were like, no, that just makes me think it's going to be a good movie. I have no specific genre associations. It just it seems like a stamp of quality. And Carpenter was like, that's like, that was the most validating thing I'd heard in my career up until that it's point. It's pretty cool. Because oh. yeah. he's really, and I mean, that's a good movie. It's a good movie. It is a good movie. It's a, it's, it's a, a really good movie. movie. It's a good movie. 
the, I think it. I I hope I'm not misattributing this, but I feel like I one of the many pieces that Drew McQueenie has written about Carpenter and his love of Carpenter's friendship with him or whatever. The first time he met him and was like flying to him, and Carpenter said, "What's what's your favorite?" movie of mine and McQueen said Starman and Carpenter smiled and said ah a romantic oh. and I always think about that it's such a sweet little anecdote but this idea that Carpenter sort of like tests his fans to be like are you a softie like mm -hmm. do you like Starman right because he probably gets a lot of the thing in Halloween yeah, and Escape right. New York and, yeah. right uh, our guest today uh, a superstar uh, a heavyweight a star a star woman of blank check uh, from Vanity Fair and Little Goldman, Katie Rich, back on the show. Hi, guys. To everyone's delight. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, Katie. What's this? Your one, six? two, three, oh my four, God, five, is it seven? six, seven. Seven. Wow. You just had that right ready. Uh, I'm so honored. You you got the, uh, you're, at, you're at your Bridges number. You and Bridges <gasps> are tied. Right. Oscar nominations and blank check appearances. I do consider myself in similar company yeah. uh, with Jeff Bridges. Well, I'm just constantly in competition with Richard Lawson, who I think is always a little bit ahead of me. But, you know, we have to keep that rivalry going to uh, keep our podcast going. Griff, there's a blank check Wikipedia page for the Five Timers Club, uh -huh. which is a, a seven person list. Uh, okay, so let me just Lawson. close oh, my sorry, eyes. Ahead. Imagine Go the ahead. burnished wood, the, the burgundy robes. Uh, Paul Simon serving drinks. Okay, go on. Uh, name the people, the members in uh, attendance. Emily, Emily Yoshida, Richard Lawson, J.D. Amato, Katie Rich, Joe Reed, David Ehrlich, and Alex Ross Perry. Um, what a list. But, Griffin, while yeah. not guests on the show, uh -huh. two actors have appeared in five or more films covered by the podcast. Okay, and, and those are the most frequent? This is what you're about yeah, to that's, read. I mean, that's what, I'm just going by the blank check wiki. Catherine Hahn and Billy Crudup are in the five-time actors club for this podcast, apparently. That can't make them the, the most frequent, though. I, look, I don't, because you think, because there's like sequels and things like that. I know. I don't understand this list because there has to be others, right? Right. Like Johnny Depp alone and Johnny Depp, the right. whole Kurt series. Russell by well, the end of you, this. You guys are just thinking about... Uh, well, Depp. It's just like people were just like, oh, we I know. To talk about so Johnny much Depp, Depp again. <laughs> Everybody's come up in other directors too, but even like, yeah, I know I'm, I'm seeing this is citing a Reddit post that was noting that Crudup and Han had just. Oh no! Here's what it is. Yep. five different mini series. Okay, oh, there you go. That makes sense. That's that's tricky. That's a so good step. Han, she was in. How do you know, Brooke? I know because I watched the movie. Okay. Tomorrowland, Bird. Forgot she's mm -hmm. in that one. Uh -huh. Hotel Transylvania 3. Of course. Uh, Classic. Not a miniseries, but I guess you put it into the standalone series. Hey, or or Tartarovsky. We'll Maybe we'll do that. more time. Yeah. The Holiday. Uh, oh, Meyer. right. Right. And The Visit. Shyamalan. Right. And then Crudup, you've got... Well, well, let me... Okay, so Crudup's uh, almost famous. Yep. Big Crudup. Fish. Burton. Uh, Public Enemies. Man. And then the, now, the other, other two are tricky. Yeah, this is hard. One's a voice role. One's a voice role. It's a, a dubbed voice, voice role. role. That's a hint. Oh, well, he's in one of the Miyazakis. He's in Princess Mononoke. Okay, right. And then right. the other is not a, you know, is a, it's not a director. It's a, a, you know, another kind of miniseries we've done. But it's main, main feed. Main feed, but he's not. You'll never remember that he's in this movie. No one remembers that he's no. in this movie. No one remembers that he's in this movie. I mean, movie. he's like the 50th person in this movie. I sure. can't even remember. It's Justice League. He's I do Justice remember who he League. played. Oh, right. And, and he's a, a Patreon Mission Impossible. MI3? Yeah. Um, that's, that's an interesting, that's interesting stat. Did I he mean, make this? He's in the Snyder Cut, right? He's, he, he is in the Snyder he's Cut. He's in oh, yeah. Yeah. even more. I've only yeah. seen yeah. the Snyder Cut. And uh, he showed up in it. And I did not know he was going to be in it. And it uh, took me by surprise. But he's not in Flash. He's not in the Flash movie? It's Ron Livingston is replacing him. <gasps> oh, they replaced him. Why? Because he was unavailable, they say. Mm, I mean, okay. they do They do look enough alike. I think there's, you can get away with a, that. There's a similar winsome a charm. Yeah. Can I tell you guys something I'm learning from this page, though, on Wikipedia? Katie Rich is the only member of the club who has never appeared on a blank, blank check special features episode. Yeah, you don't live in New wow. York City, Katie. Wow. Come through. I, wow. I gotta come to you. Are you guys still doing those only in person? We've been trying to do them more in person. Um, we've been doing them in person again because we can do them. But, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, 
Yeah. The other thing is, I I will say we have increasingly gone guestless on those, like because it just you know it felt it's like people like we 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 have guests almost every episode on main feed. They're like right. we want they just ask for the guest classic vibes. energy. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Next time I come to your apartment, David, I am just going to start monologuing about a movie and you have to record it. I'm just going to force my way on there. Please. Well, there's also, I feel like we have internally pitched, and I feel like we must have said this to you at some point, but the idea of doing a Charlie's Choice oh, where yeah. we would do a commentary episode for a movie that he picked. I thought you guys were going to road trip down here and we did on my that couch. That was the plan. We were going to. One of so many things. And there was COVID. this pandemic caused by the novel coronavirus. But Katie, if we did a commentary episode a charlie's choice with charlie how many yeah. how long would he make it I, I mean there's a reason i'm pitching commentary rather than classic format because i imagine right. if we're just watching, watching a movie, movie right, right right but like could he could he sit through it or would he 20 minutes and get bored he, he would definitely sit through it i don't know if he would talk much because he usually sits and watches movies and kind of like rap silence respectful but- uh, I, I was I was coming ready with some mind blowing information for the longtime listeners who remember Charlie appearing on the Titanic episode. Our youngest then, yeah. ever guest. He started kindergarten last week, guys. I sure did. Um, that was, <laughs> it brings me no pleasure to report. I no, it is wild. That is that is some wild passage of time shit. Um, it really is. Because you were saying right before we recorded that this is your third pandemic episode, which is its own kind of scary mm. passage of time thing. Uh, yeah. But to think about him being an infant. Uh, in, in that studio. Yeah. He was younger than my daughter is now. He was right. only like four months old, right? Like three, yeah. months, he, he three was, four months old. Tiny. Yeah, yeah. Like tiny, really, tiny. really tiny. Um, no, he, he, he's got his spot reserved. I gotta, I'm, I'm just going to keep you guys posted on when I feel like he's ready for the commentary moment and get on down here. I ask David for the, for the update every once in a while, but I want to ask you directly. If asked tomorrow, what do you think his pick would be? I mean, we just picked Coco back up, like, after a long time. Like, we, we watched right. it, like, every day when he was little, like, two. And then we hadn't watched it in ages. And he, like, picked it to watch himself the other day. And we watched the entire thing. And, like, I cried at the end. And I was, like, telling him why I like it. And uh, so, like, I feel like tomorrow it would be Coco. Next week it could be an episode of the Octonauts. I don't know if you guys accept that as a as an entry for... Not accepted. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> dealing with the fucking Octonauts. Cannot log it. Not going to happen. This is a conversation I've been having with David. Like, David, do you realize you're in your final stretch of not having to give a shit about, like, Paw Patrol and stuff? Right. And he's like, well, maybe I, I, I avoid yeah. Paw Patrol. And I'm like, you avoid Paw Patrol, you get PJ Masks. It's yeah, not... Yeah, no, you get, you get the Netflix ecosystem where it's, like, dubbed French-Canadian, like, shows that barely <laughs> right. exist. So, so much of some of which are not so bad. I will say, and David knows about this, that we went through a strong Detective Pikachu phase earlier mm. this year. So I feel I bought like him we a could, Pikachu. I feel, yeah, you did, and it, it's uh, it's treasured. Um, so I feel like Hell we yeah. could pull that off if we if we played our cards right. Okay, yeah. I just know he goes through he goes through obsessive phases that he'll like mm-hmm. rewatch a movie compulsively for a yeah, month totally. Or so. Yeah, so I'm always interested in what the movie of the month is. Um, yeah, he went through like a big soul thing too, right? Oh yeah, we 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 got really into soul for yeah. a long while around when that came out. I mean, Sing was huge. I'm like right, worried about right. the seismic impact Sing Two is going to have on our lives. Ooh, boy, does he know about Sing Two? Like, yeah, is we he watched aware? the trailer. He we knows know. he knows that Bono plays a lion and he gets the and <laughs> in the billing. Yeah, no, and, and that he has an original song and is probably probably going to go win an Oscar for it. So he, we're we're ready. We've prepared on it. Bono, level. Bono is waiting for that Oscar. Bono keeps plugging away. He's going to win two Oscars this year. He's going to win supporting actor and original song. Wait, wait for a supporting actor for saying he's going to be the yeah, first voice yeah, actor to, yeah, uh, to win an Oscar. Correct. He's ready. I just love like their their like sort of like gauntlet throw of and Bono where you're like. <laughs> Whoa, wait a second. I didn't even realize that was part of the equation. <laughs> and they're singing, um, I still haven't found what I'm looking for in the trailer. So it's like, Correct. here's old Bono and new Bono. And he's doing like a real voice. He's doing like a zoo TV like. He, well, that's the thing. Bono, Bono loves to do a character. Yeah. He'll do a bit. <laughs> yeah. <I don't. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Clay Calloway is his character name. Uh, does Sam, uh, Katie has another son. Oh, does Sam, is he as movie centric as Charlie? Because I feel like Charlie, right. Charlie really likes movies. Not at all. He'll watch like two things on Netflix and then otherwise we'll like go do whatever he wants. But Sam, Sam seems like a more physical, outdoorsy More physical, child. more yes. interested in like doing whatever else. Uh, but because of Sing, uh, Elton John's I'm Still Standing has been like in the rotation for years. And now that is Sam's favorite song, even though he's like not really seen Sing, but he just knows the song. So like we're on like year three of I'm Still Standing, just like 
on a loop all but the time. He, but he has watched Rocket Man, right? That's the other. <laughs> I've shown them the end well, of Rocket Man. he loves Karen. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we all, it was Karen's a voice and sing. That's how, that's right. where it all ties back together. He sings I'm Still Standing, so. Yeah. Yeah, so have me on the Sing Patreon episode, I think is what I'm uh We're going to wait for. for Sing 3 so we can just yeah. do this. Yeah, you made guys sing? Do Didn't Garth someone Jennings. real make Sing? Yeah, Garth that's Jennings. Thing. Garth Hammer and Tongues. Sings. Yeah. Yeah, you like wonder about like, oh, what happened to that guy? And then it's like, he's just collecting money. He is incredibly wealthy. He's hanging out with Bono. He'll get thanked in Bono's Oscars bench. Here's another weird fact, and then I swear we'll talk about John Carpenter's star man. But <laughs> Garth Jennings is very good friends with Wes Anderson, and Wes Anderson has a voice role in Sing. Are you kidding me? No, I mean, I respect does. that. Do you think Wes Anderson, does he have kids? Wes, doesn't Wes Anderson have kids? What? Yes, Maybe he like does. one of his kids loves, uh, one loves Sing. Wes Anderson plays Daniel, a giraffe who auditions with the song <gasps> Ben. Uh huh. That, yep. that sounds great. Yep, I know that giraffe. I cannot believe I never knew that. Edgar Wright plays a goat. Yeah. Uh, the amount of times I have seen seen Sing is incalculable, and I can't believe I didn't know that. This is changing Katie. everything. So this is what I'm in for, Katie. <laughs> Most likely, right? <laughs> I gotta go rewatch it. Yeah. No, you're in, you're in for it. Um, today we're we're talking about uh Starman, which is certainly a a big. I don't know if it's a turning point in Carpenter's career, but it's a real shift for him. Uh, not a permanent shift, but like, I, I mean, he was in an interesting spot because his movies had been sort of going up and up and up and up until the thing when he finally gets his blank check and it like implodes like the Challenger launch. Uh, people chase him out of Hollywood with pitchforks. And then Christine is kind of like a rebound movie, right? Like Christine is like, I got to do something that's going to work. And more, right, like, I'll do familiar ter territory, I'll do a horror movie, like, I'll, I'll do what people want from John Carpenter. And S Stephen King is kind of like a proven franchise in and of himself at that point. Especially at that point. Right, right. Yeah. right. So is, is it a one for them? Like, were they like, yeah, he'll do it? Or what did he feel? I haven't, you got, this Christine episode has not come out yet, so I don't know what you guys said about it. I don't know. I mean, I think... The whole thing was like he was the pick to make Christine. Like, yeah, they wanted him. He was the first pick. But then classically, much, you know, much like Stephen King. Oh, Stephen King eventually sort of turned on him because Stephen King just gets in these really grumpy about these movies, like yeah. uh, these adaptations where I feel like he's often enthusiastic for a while. And then he's like, I, you know, whatever. I hate what they did. He famously thought he could beat Stanley Kubrick in a uh, reputation off about The Shining. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think. I think, you know, Carpenter, like his his ones for them have always been him picking the most strategically sound movie that he actually wants to do. You know, I don't think he has ever done something purely as a career calculation. Yeah. And he's good at avoiding projects that don't suit him, especially in this first half of his career. I think perhaps he might not have made that movie if the thing had been a hit. You know, he might have followed like a wilder passion project. And that was a little bit safer, but I think a thing he really wanted to do and prove that he could like deliver on budget, on time and whatever. And then that movie's a hit. It's a big hit. People like it. So Columbia's like, Carpenter, baby, come on, make, make yourself comfortable, you know? Right. You're, you're Columbia Pictures boy now. Uh, Starman is a script that has been percolating for years. The famous thing about this movie is that uh, Columbia Pictures had two scripts. One of them, Starman, the other one called Night Skies. Both of them were about friendly aliens who land on Earth and befriend lonely people. Uh, they did extensive focus groups on the two films at the script stage to see which concepts seemed to have more uh, broad commercial appeal. Uh, it was Starman, hands down. Uh, so they let go of Night Skies and let Universal acquire it and turn around. And that movie became E.T., the highest grossing film in history. So Starman got tagged with this reputation of like well a now we look stupid because we let et go in favor of this thing that we still haven't made b we're now scared that this is too similar to et and people will think it's a ripoff and c i think there was just kind of like bad juju around the whole thing for a while right that's the, exactly bad vibes because it's right like this is the the you pick wrong most likely even though starman is good and they didn't make it like they went through a bunch of different directors and all this press. Like, but like, why didn't they make it before ET? Just because they couldn't decide what they wanted to do with it. I th I think that was a part of it, and the directors, right? 
Yeah, and also I think the script wasn't that good. This is a Michael Douglas project, even though he's not credited. Is he credited as an executive yeah, producer? Yeah, yeah he's credited, not, as but not as a yeah, main producer. Um, but but you know, but this was a project he shepherded, and there's this script. The script that the script is credited to Bruce Evans and uh, Reynold Gideon, and that was the script. But of course, like Dean Reisner is the actual writer of the movie we saw. Basically, like he did a massive rewrite, then that's what brought Carpenter on board. Th- that's the period of time where, for years, new directors are coming on board and leaving, redeveloping it. And then Columbia, in between, will hire new writers to try to change it to come up with what is the right take for this movie. But so, right. So, first it's John Badham, who had done Saturday Night Fever and Dracula. So, he was like, you know, he was hot shit. And he does war games instead. Yeah. And I think E.T. just got there faster. Uh, then when E.T. comes out and blows up, Badham quits because uh, he's just like, I don't want to have to follow that. Yeah. Uh, so then it goes to Adrian Lyne. Adrian Lyne, right. And Adrian Lyne wants to do the movie partly because he wants to break into Hollywood and he thinks he made this piece of shit movie that no one's going to like. And then Flashdance is a colossal hit. And he's like, fuck you. I can go right. make whatever I want now. Like, I'll, I'll see you later. <laughs> right. I'm I'm going back to England. I don't need this shit anymore. Uh, and that begins the crazy Adrian Lyne thing where like every movie he makes after his hits is a huge flop. And then he's like, fine, fine. I guess I'll make Fatal Attraction. And then it's a huge hit. OK, I want to make Je- Jacob's Ladder. It's a bomb. OK, well, I'll go make I'll go make Indecent Proposal. This thing sounds like a piece of shit. It's a hit. You know, like it's over and over again. Lyne's got a wild career. It would be so good. It would be such a good filmography. It would be our horniest miniseries ever. We should tie it to that Ben Affleck movie. God knows whenever it, that thing is getting dumped in like January or whatever. Yeah. Oh, uh, I cannot wait to see it. We were supposed to have a sexy ass press tour with those two. And then they broke up and then Jennifer Lopez shows up and Jennifer Lopez is right. singing and buried deep water. Fuck. It's Affleck and arm. Yes, it was one of those wow. publicity romances that then seemed to kind of be real for a bit. And then obviously it disintegrated. Right. Yeah, Netflix yep. was like, guess I'll call J-Lo up, <laughs> steal her away from A-Rod or whatever it is he's done. So it's a gift he, he gave us, to be clear. He's just sitting on his like throne, surrounded by like crushed Duncan cups, dragging on his vape and being like, I don't know, does J-Lo want to go out with me? I just think it's incredible that like, <laughs> I, I've read all these dumb fucking articles about how like Will Smith is revolutionizing Hollywood and he's got this fucking company of like social media branding and he's like, other stars hire him to do what he did for himself and all this shit. And I'm like, Affleck is getting no credit for being like the great American meme creator. Every yes. fucking thing he does not only like goes viral, but becomes like some sort of like spirit animal for a different type of mood. Exactly. He's like this walking avatar of America in covid or whatever when when he's up when he's down when he's happy when he's horny when he's angry when he's drunk when he's sober it's all like all of it hits he he and keanu reeves are just he's like both like either side of a coin like keanu reeves everything you see of him is just like what a gift what an angel from god if an Affleck is like earth is hell (laughs) and and you're like yeah i get that too the whole thing with affleck I mean, I think I've done this rant before, but like we're basically he's basically gearing up for his third comeback. He's had a comeback within playing Batman yes. where he he <laughs> gets the Batman role at the height of his second comeback. Nobody likes the Batman movie. And now everyone's sort of like he was a good Batman. And I'm like, <laughs> was he? He, like what, are we sure like you know and they're like he should come back as batman and i'm like he never left he's still batman <laughs> but but he's like he is like keanu in that way too where it's just like every seven years it's like done cooked over never coming back exactly the enough from this guy i don't want to <laughs> yeah. hear about it and he's like i guess i'll like make a movie that is good i'll just direct it and like i'll do three of those and win best picture uh the incredible 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 uh, what was the thing I was going to say about Affleck? I don't fucking remember. Uh, but don't forget, he's got the last duel coming at Venice, like within a matter of days as we record this. So like that could ruin it all. No, it could no. increase it. No it's telling. Roll. It's going to roll. It roll. is wild that those like the paparazzi photos came out when they were filming the movie and it was like, these haircuts are a disaster. How's anyone going to take this movie seriously? And then you watch the trailer and you're like, hmm, haircut's pretty good. It, it is such <laughs> a clear like, oh, right. Like directing and framing and lighting matters. Yeah. Cinema. I can't wait for yeah. the last Cinema. duel. God, 
What a thing. Those those dopes. Those Boston dopes. We'll never be rid of him. I mean, Ridley Scott's about to run circles around everybody all fall. He's 82 years old. I mean, you guys, I know you've talked about doing Ridley Scott a million times, but like, good Lord, that man. Do it tomorrow. I mean, Do an episode a day. He's made, he's made 45 movies. like some, 45 masterpieces. It's the rest of your life. Calling. I don't think it's 45. He's made like 25. It's a lot. Something like that. It's yeah. also wild that unlike Soderbergh, where the joke is like, oh, he made like five movies while we were having this conversation, but they're all on an iPhone. Ridley Scott's like, no, they're like humongous $200 million productions yep. shot in he's foreign countries two, with expansive cast. Huge original movies for grownups coming out within like fucking days of each other both practically. shot during a pandemic both yep. starring adam driver america's favorite giant weirdo <laughs> like it's gonna rule it's gonna yes. be great god i know he i know last duel was supposed to come out last year so it's not quite but still you know still but it was it was supposed to come out last year when they thought they were going to be able to complete filming. That's the exactly. thing. They started so, you know, filming yeah. that movie like a week before everything shut down, and then it was down for ten months. Ridley Scott probably like got COVID five times. And doesn't <laughs> care. He probably it has it right anybody. now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think COVID got Ridley Scott. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> uh, what if I just do Chuck Norris bits? What about exactly. Ridley Scott? It's like we're doing Ridley Scott back. <laughs> yeah. Bring my bring. Click. Hello. Who's on the phone? It's been a few weeks. Hey, man. Hey, man. Uh, hey, man. It's the dude, man. Oh, my goodness. The famed, uh, the dude. I, I love you. You're from the Big Lebowski. Yeah. Jeffrey Lebowski. Dude, That's man. your name. Yeah. No, don't call me Jeffrey Lebowski. I'm the dude, man. You're the dude. I know. And you abide, of course. I do. Yeah, man. But, I mean, I think I need some help, man. Uh, why do you need some help? What's the matter, dude? I don't know, man. Things are stressing me out. This world is wild, man. That's fair. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's rough, dude. Um, well, if you're looking for some help, maybe something's interfering with your happiness, preventing yeah. you from achieving your goals. Better help is going to assess your needs and match you with a licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. You have a cell phone, right, dude? You've got no, a smartphone. Oh, man, no. I don't All believe right, well, in that kind of thing. <laughs> I was wondering. But anyway, look, BetterHelp, it's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's just professional therapy, but it's done securely online. Okay, there's a broad range of expertise available. Might not be available locally in many areas. Maybe not in your area. I don't know where you're hanging out these days. Uh, it's home. available worldwide. Home, sure. Uh, you still, you still got your place with the rug that tied the room together. Yeah, man. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking of references to your life. Look, you can log into your account anytime. You can send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. You can have weekly video or phone sessions. You don't have to sit in a waiting room as with traditional therapy. Uh, it's more affordable. Financial aid is available. You can go to their website, betterhelp.com slash reviews and check out some testimonials. Um, and look, they've got great therapeutic matches that they want to facilitate. They make it easy and free to change therapists if you need to. Sounds great, man. I'm so happy that it sounds great. I really want you to get some help, dude, because you sound real worn out. Yeah, I feel worn out. I lived through a goddamn pandemic, man. Yeah, I'm amazed you lived through it. Uh, Go to betterhelp.com slash check. That's better H-E-L-P. And join the over 2 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. They're recruiting additional therapists in all 50 states. So it's a special offer for Blank Check listeners, which I assume you are, dude. Of course, man. Yeah, what was your favorite miniseries? Nancy Myers, man. Amazing. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Check. That's H E L P, of course. Better H E L P dot com slash check. 10% off. All right, dude. I'll let you Bye. go. Bye. Bye, man. Bye. Starman. Okay. So then it goes to, ironically enough, segue, it goes to Tony Scott. Tony Scott wants to make it full, sort of genre, hyper stylized, what have you. And this is right before um, Top Gun. So it's like post The Hunger or whatever. Right when he's like a very stylish filmmaker. So everyone 
anyone who touched this movie like then made a gigantic hit or was about to make a giant like yeah <laughs> yeah it's true it didn't make sense what's the secret to my success i turned down starman <laughs> then it goes to mark rydell who i i guess left this to do on golden pond i i guess so does that Our match the movie pattern? that we've never seen Right. No, yeah. on Golden Pond is 81. So my guess is it's right after. Yes. And so he goes on to do The River, which is that movie with um, Mel Gibson and Sissy Spacek. Right. What if okay. there was a river? I've never seen it, but it was like, a you know, like Spacek got an Oscar nom for that. It, oh, yeah. It was that like was a, in the you know. Starman Oscar season. It came out the, the same year. Right. If there you was know, a it, was, river. it was a movie. Yeah. What if there was a fucking river? Uh, so he kind of breaks the trend a little bit. Although it gets by four Academy Awards and one honorary win. Mm. An on for, oh, it got like a sound or whatever. It won yeah. a special achievement in sound effects editing. Um, uh, Mark Rydell, uh, I, th I think, was when they start to skew it more towards what if we do the more humanist, performance based, emotional movie, not try to lean into the genre elements. And then when Rydell leaves, that's sort of the, the script that comes across his desk. And it's exciting to him because he's like, they're never going to let me do a romantic comedy or drama. But here is a movie that on its face looks like a sci-fi movie, which they will hire me to do. Assume that I'll be more interested in the genre elements, but really this is my sneaky way to let them, let get them to let me make yeah. a grown-up romance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and he basically says the original draft, well, what Carpenter says is the original draft, quote, ends with Starman blowing up the government with his ray gun. I don't really know how that works, but <laughs> the whole, the entire U.S. government, <laughs> the whole government with his ray gun. And he says this Dean Reisner rewrite is the total humanization, right? You know, makes changes, makes the character less hostile. It's all, all the that. dialogue. It's the script that he signed on to. And then they assumed that he would split screenplay credit because the WGA, uh, you know, gives tremendous weight to whoever originally started a script, even if almost nothing is left. And instead, they just give full credit to the original guys. And this is an odd movie that is dedicated to the man who wrote the screenplay, who is still <laughs> alive, but couldn't get a credit on the movie otherwise. Uh, Dean Reisner, who also I encourage everyone to look up on Wikipedia because his uh, picture is him as a child actor. He's was a child actor named Dinky Dean. <laughs> what? And so if you Google Dean Reisner, I you can like see a little picture of a cute four-year-old boy from the 1920s who was in like a Charlie Chaplin movie. And then I guess as he grew up, he became like a famous rewrite guy in Hollywood, which he rules. wrote a 1939 Ronald Reagan movie called Code of the Secret Service. His most notable role was in Charlie Chaplin's short film, The Pilgrim. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> Dinky D. Oh, he's cute. He's Hang really on, cute. He's cutie. He won an Oscar for directing Bill and Koo in 1948, a feature film with a cast of real birds costumed as humans acting on the world's smallest film set. I'm sorry. Oh, he I won, have oh, to he read won this. an honorary Academy Award. That's Are you seeing what it's for, David? I, I want to read it. Can I please read it? Can I please read yes. it? Please. Uh, I'm sorry. It's an honorary Academy Award for Bill and Koo in which, quote, artistry and patience blended in a novel and entertaining use of the medium of motion pictures. I like the very pointed use of the word patience there because people were clearly <laughs> just like, how do you fucking film these birds? <laughs> you gotta wait. They're not gonna, they're not gonna do anything you ask. You gotta wait for them. Artistry he and patience. also married Vampira. Uh, the famous 50s campy what? TV hostess. What? Yes. Uh, whose real name was Malia Nurmi. Um, and I don't think they were married All for right, that dinky, long. They divorced dang. in the 50s. Vampira, yeah. wow. by the way. Vampira. Vampires. What did I say? Yeah. Vampira? Weird. Yeah. What's wrong uh, with you? Wow. Star, star, of course, of uh, Play Nine for Outer Space. Um, what a life. This is My incredible. Life. Dinky yes. Dean. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> dinky Dean. <laughs> He gets a screenplay credit on Dirty Harry, but then most, and, and uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, play, play Missy, Missy for me. me. Uh, but then most of his work is uncredited rewrite work, High Plains Drifter, The Enforcer, Rich Man, Poor Man, Godfather Part 3. He's one of those famous, like, uh, you don't know, you know, Dean Reisner, that's the guy you need. You know, like he, he re rewrites everything in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, but hey, Dinky Dean. Dinky we Dean. love him. 
Uh, we stand him and Carpenter very much is like that's the script. His script is the script I found, um, which is cool, and it's a good script. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and he sort of got first crack at it. Like it, the rewrite was done in between directors. They bring it to him. He goes like, "I love this. I'd make this right away." Um, and uh, so they do. Michael Douglas was the one who originally developed this movie because he wanted to star in it, and that would have been a disaster. There is no oh, yeah. form of this movie. Obviously, it's impossible to imagine him being in this Carpenter movie with this draft, but I don't even think he would work in a more action-oriented version of this movie. I mean, this is, what, a year or two before Wall Street or whatever? It's not like this is a, this is a time in his career where he played softer characters. Like no, the this guy, comes out the same year as Romancing the Stone, right? 84. Yeah, the yeah. guy excelled yes. at CAD and yes. slime ball. Like, you yeah. know, that was his He slime. would just seem so hostile in this Yeah, yeah he would be like, get away from this hide- guy. <laughs> he's hiding something. He's obviously trying to blow up the earth. With his ray gun, he's going to kill the government. <laughs> he's going to kill the whole damn government. <laughs> I, I will say also, like, uh, Michael Douglas very much seems like he is from Earth to a fault. Yeah. You know, like, I'm like, yeah, that is a human. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, like Ben Affleck is paparazzi photos. He embodies all of our worst aspects. Right. Right. I mean, we've like talked about this with Douglas, but like Douglas was like the, the dark id of the American 80s, you know? Absolutely. Yes. Um, Bridges. It, is- He's a surprising choice, though. He is. Well, have you guys have, have you guys done bridges on this show? Have we done bridges ever? Have Griffin? we ever crossed Probably a bridge? Not this early. Have we ever driven across? Crossed, a hasn't he been in a Marvel movie? <laughs> we did. He's Iron in Man, Iron Man. Oh, sure, sure. We right. talked about that, and that's right. actually a great performance, and we yeah. do stand it. We do. And obviously, we're going to do Barbara Streisand at some point, so we'll do the Mirror Has Two Faces. You know, uh, we're going to do. Heaven's Gate feels inevitable. I mean, we have to. Yeah, he doesn't have a huge role in that, but that would be great. But no, I don't think we've ever no. really talked about one of my all-time favorite actors, the star of my mother's favorite, my my mother's second favorite movie. Yeah, which is guess. I know what it mother's is. Second, you the Big Lebowski. <laughs> no, although she, I think she kind of liked the Big Lebowski. Ben laughing at his own funny. joke without hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's favorite movie is Powell and Pressburgers. I know where I'm going. Uh, my mother's second favorite movie is The Fabulous Baker Boys, the Steve Close uh, movie, which favorite American is movie. a wonderful movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've seen it many times because my mother loves it so much. And yeah. he is so good in it. It's funny, like a Carpenter also, I just remember, I forget what it was, but like walking by some, uh, 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 not why I say Carpenter, Bridges, Walking by some poster for a Bridges movie when I was a little kid, or maybe it was they played a trailer before uh, whatever dumb kids movie my dad was taking me to see. And my dad just turned to me and going, he's like one of the best actors alive. He might be my favorite actor. Like, I have this very distinct memory of of my dad just being like, he's like the Anointing best. him, like yeah. pointing at that guy. I'm trying to remember what the first Bridges like, because he's, he's a real grown up actor. Like he yeah, does, yeah. apart from Tron, he doesn't do a lot of kids movies. Well, he's in White Squall, which I never saw, but I remember that movie being everywhere. But I only remember the kids in that. Yeah, yeah that's I, a lot of kid. kids. Um, it might have been something like fucking Arlington Road. Yeah, I think the first movie I saw him in was The Contender. Yeah. and Which he is unbelievable in. It's, it's such a good performance in a mediocre movie. Have you seen The Contender, Katie? Griffin, I assume uh, you've seen in it. 2000 like, yeah, or a long like time ago. right after right. like yeah. it's been a very long time yeah and i remember rod lurie who you know used to be a film critic and he becomes this director and he's makes he wrote this giant diary about the making the contender that was in empire magazine mm-hmm. and i read it so many times because he just makes jeff bridges sound like the coolest motherfucker alive <laughs> yeah there's like some moment where like bridges is all dressed up and he's coming out of the makeup room and he's like the dude is the president like and stuff like that and like Bridges would take all these pictures on set and like you know oh he, he like just he, seems like, like a, a maximum big chiller. vintage camera guy there have been like yeah. books published of all his on set photos mm-hmm. but then also just photos of him walking around various cities and countrysides and stuff what a fucking rad dude. anytime he's on like a you know podcast or he's doing an interview he seems so friendly so relaxed, so happy to talk about what, you know, whatever you want to talk about, right? Like, you know, you go anywhere. 
And, and I would argue one of the least pretentious actors of that stature. Like on screen or off or both? Both. Yeah. Both. That's it, the, and it's it's yeah. why people undervalue him yes. to this day, even yes. though obviously he's very famous and very beloved. Like right. right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. He he is one of these guys, and I think it is uh emblematic of uh, dudes who grew up uh with dads who were just kind of working actors, right? Who were like never big stars, and it was like it's a job, I'm in the studio system, I'm doing 10 pictures a week. I'm doing 80 episodes of a, a fucking like daytime TV show, like whatever it is, like it's a job, it's a craft, right? Like they're taught yeah. these things like it is carpentry, no pun intended. I feel like like Brian Cranston talks about it the same way, where he's like, my dad was like a marginally successful actor who was never famous, and I just kind of learned discipline from him, and I never viewed all the trappings of the other shit, you know? And yeah. uh, I feel like Bridges, unlike a lot of guys of his class and his stature, uh, who will brag about the sort of extremes they went to to transform themselves for performances and all their method acting shit, you hear these stories about things that Bridges did for movies and then he kind of like shrugs them off. He's just quietly doing it. Right. Like this is a movie where he famously worked with uh, dance instructors to unlearn all of his Walking. like body language. <laughs> How to work. Right. He was like, make me a blank slate. Like, take everything out of my system. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's that story I remember when he won the Oscar and uh, I think Michelle Pfeiffer was presenting and she told the story about how on uh, Fabulous Baker Boys, he had the makeup people paint broken capillaries onto his nose to like belie the character's past as an alcoholic. And she was like, that doesn't read on camera. And he was like, yeah, but it helps me. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> was that one of the years that they had all the pre previous co-stars yes, come up? It might have been. That was what? around when they were doing that. Yeah, the yeah. best. I fucking hated that shit. That, it was good. I that know. Was so I, good. I am the rare Oscar super fan who hated that. I because most Oscar super fans I know yeah. love that. I want an Oscar clip. That's what I want. Well, I want to see a clip of the yeah, performance, the and then at the end, Sissy Spacek goes everything. She smashes the plate. <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck is that movie? She smashes the plate. I got to see this thing. Yeah. That was, there's a very specific thing that I think the three of us share, which is like watching the Oscars when you're eight. And there's a movie that is like, yes. you're never going to be allowed to watch. And also, you know, you'd probably be bored by it, but you watch the clip and you're like, huh, that's great acting. Like, I guess what? that's yeah. right. Now I know. The first movie for me was The Crying Game. When I watched the Oscars when I was like six years old, and there was a movie called The Crying Game. And I'm like, that sounds like the most grown up movie right. of all time. Like, so what fucking the fuck serious. Does that mean? <laughs> yeah. And then you see, like, you know, this poster with Miranda Richardson's got this, you know, wig on. And you're like, what is this about? What is a crying game? Right. Now that, that was the English patient for me. Like, it took me yeah. years into adulthood yes. to actually be like, what is the English patient about? Because it was just like, this is a very serious movie what for adults. If it has an there airplane was in it. An English patient. That, There's a desert and an airplane, and uh, it's sad. That That's was what I knew. definitely the first Oscars I watched as well, so I remember that sticking out. Um, what was the thing I was going to say? The, the one I always think of is uh, uh, Fernanda Montenegro in Central Station. <laughs> Central Station, sure. Where her clip was like so quiet and understated. It was like someone talking to her in close-up and her listening, and everyone was like, oh, so good. <laughs> like I was at some party with my parents and their friends, and the clip played, and everyone was like, God, what a good performance. And I was like, What's going on? Like, how do you? <laughs> I want to be a grown up so Why I can understand. Why wasn't she crying? Right, like, I'm just gonna yeah. nod along with right. it. But I was like, that's aspirational. Everyone's looking at a woman listen in a foreign language, and they're like, "God, amazing performance!" Right? We did the 2001 Oscars on Little Gold Men uh, very recently, and uh, uh, Joe Reed, our, all of our friend, uh, had the video clip of it because you know when you watch clips of Oscars on they YouTube, cut they cut the movie clips because yes. they don't have the rights, yes. and so if you get Bomb some like. Mark. Weird ass pirated thing with half of the Barbara Walter special in front of it. You get to actually see Sissy Spacek throwing the dishes. It was that year, and it was Every, just like, oh, that was one of those things where like we knew that was the clip, and it was like, are they gonna get like cheeky with us and do some other clip? Because you know she's got other good clips in that movie. I, and they were like, no, 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 we're hitting you in the face with this. And then she didn't win. Yeah, but you know, monsters, and it's, but then yeah. Halle Berry's Monsters Ball clip is her oh, at the hospital, screaming, pounding and screaming, and you're bus. like, whoa, like this yeah. is this is high and then Nicole Kidman's right. from Mulan Rouge 
it was just her like trying to vamp in front of right. Uh, they the picked bad guy, the goofiest and it's so clip. silly. It's yes, so great. Like yes. it's, 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 it's a flex. Uh, we got to do Lerman too. I've been thinking about Lerman a lot because I just watched the fucking girl boss Cinderella movie, which is rancid and is going to set women back a hundred years. <laughs> And it is weird that that's the official title is the fucking <laughs> girl boss Cinderella movie that is rancid and gonna set women back a hundred years. And it's trying An Amazon to do the Mulan original. Rouge thing. Yeah, Amazon original Prime Video September third. <laughs> it's trying to do the Mulan Rouge thing of like, oh, it's like a jukebox musical where we just like pick songs we like. You know, right. where it's like, you know, oh, the prince sings somebody to love because he wants somebody to love, and it's like. That's wow. not what Moulin Rouge is. No. That is misunderstanding yep. Moulin no, Rouge. No, it, it is. Of course. But you know what I'm no, saying? No, I'm not you accusing know, you Moulin of Rouge is, is a grab. Exactly. And I'm like, wow, Moulin Rouge, uh, a lot harder to pull off than maybe, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's such a yeah. good movie. Well, you'll you'll uh, you'll do your like fifteenth Tom Hanks movie with his uh, Elvis. Uh, no, it's not me. When's Tom, that coming out? Name? Yeah, it's I don't Tom know. Parker. It's the movie they gave Tom Hanks yeah. COVID. It's like kind of right. That's another one where it like shot for like five days and then COVID happened and it was shut down for like ten. And then months. Tom Hanks got COVID. Right. The crazy, like, the crazy one the is the card counter because I think the card counter filmed all but one day. Correct. And they had to shut down maybe two, like or something like that. It was the opposite. And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like they they finally resumed production like five months later and they like finished whatever they needed to finish. Well, and the story is that like, of course, uh, uh, fucking Schrader was like, Schrader was like, come on, March 15th. Just let me go on set. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, God, I, I don't know how much longer I got. Let's just finish the card counter at very least. Look, let me on set. I'm not, you know, I'm not. I don't have a ton of time on my hands right now. Right, um, I'll bring a loaded gun and I'll shoot COVID if I have to. <laughs> Yeah, imagine it with a big fan just being like, I'm keeping yeah. it away. It's a white It's fine. <laughs> um, my, yeah, we should do my Paul Schrader Lord, impression. It's like five movies. My Paul Schrader yeah, impression Paul is just Admiral like Burgess Akbar. Meredith? <laughs> <laughs> well, between Paul Schrader and Ridley Scott, like the series of directors physically going to war with COVID, you guys yeah. got to keep this going. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. Uh, Lerman is six movies. Like, what yeah, Lerman. Lerman. is doing Lerman? It's yeah. so easy. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, if you do Lerman, I got to get Australia. I'm putting that on, on the record as fast as I can. Because sure, that movie, it. I, I saw the movie twice in theaters and I haven't seen it since, but I, I, I'm just going to say it holds up. Huh, this is an interesting we'll question. I know this is a big tangent episode, but we're talking about things that I think people will be interested by. Uh, it was supposed to come out this year when Warner Brothers made the HBO Max day and date announcement. Elvis was on the slate and then they announced it was getting pushed six months of 2022. Do you think that is Boz Lerman always taking four times longer to make a movie and finish a movie than he tells people he will? He, he is notorious for doing that to be or fair. and or do you think he was like this is playing in a fucking theater, you assholes. But like if, if Dillian Villeneuve couldn't do it, like is, are they going to let Boz Lerman do it? Like I felt like they weren't giving directors that choice. They weren't, but I can also see Boz Lerman being like, I have to do more reshoots. And they're like, oh, Boz. <laughs> like, all right. Yeah, I also think Boz <laughs> always has like bizarre contracts. Like he just always has kind of absurd levels of autonomy and freedom within the studio. Um, I love him. Oh, God. I don't oh, even, yeah. you know, Mullen Rouge isn't even my favorite. Romeo and Juliet, that, that movie is perfect. I, yeah. It's one of my, like, yeah, 20 favorite movies. I fucking love that movie so much. Um, and I love Mullen Rouge. I love Boslin. I love the guy. Yeah, watching those Oscars and watching Catherine Martin win her, she won two Oscars for costumes and production yeah. design. It was just glorious. Like, love her. Happy to see her. Boz cheering for in the audience. Also, that great. movie is crazy, and it came out in America in May, and it, like, in one of the most loaded Oscar years ever, and it fucking got nominations. Yeah, and yeah, it like kind of it kind of underperformed at the box office as yeah, a summer movie. Then 9 11 happens and that comes back around and people are like, Are th is this gonna win Best Picture? Hey man. It's crazy that the last movie Buzz Lerman made is Great Gatsby, which probably like True Grit made $170 million, like some Dude, insane yeah. hit for yes, what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good movie. and uh and it's that was in twenty thirteen. Yeah, it's crazy. It takes a long time. I saw him I walking from Ben Planet once. I was and Super stoned. What was her? You, you saw him No, where? I was just going to say, I saw him walk in a Forbidden Plan at the comic book store and buy a Wonder Woman umbrella. Really? That's good. Yeah. That That's good. Rules. It, right? That's a what? good detail. It's a good anta. And it was a thing. Where it's not a comic. It's an umbrella. He bought that was a Wonder really Woman really umbrella. <laughs> I'm imagining Boslerm and like, it starts to rain. He's on the corner of like Broadway and 13th. <laughs> and he's like, he sees like a normal umbrella store and he sees a Forbidden Plan. And he's like, 
You know, I bet you Forbidden Planet has a fun. David, <laughs> David, those were the exact circumstances. And he walked around the store for like 20 minutes looking at comic books like he was Starman, like tilting his entire head. <laughs> you know, like not touching anything, but just looking at like, what you is define this? Batman. Hot Toys Rocket <laughs> Raccoon. And then, you know, and then he just bought his Wonder Woman umbrella and left back into the rain. God, what a fucking legend that we got to do him. It's in June. We can do him, Griffin. Let's do him. Let's sneak him. Well, maybe we should do it in July. Let's sneak him. Mm, okay. Bring, bring. Click. Hello. Hey, man. Oh, boy. <laughs> dude, what's up? I already got you some help. Why are you calling me, dude, man? Oh, who am I talking to? I'm so sorry. Country singer and alcoholic, Bad Blake, man. That's a big pull. I could not have told you your name. You're you're the guy who sings the weary kind, right? Yeah, and I'm feeling real weary. I got a bad heart, man. I used to have a crazy heart, and now I got bad heart health. I'm trying to make my heart better, man. Uh, do you like cooking, but you maybe want it to be a little easier, more fun, more affordable? Healthier, healthier, man. I'm looking to get healthier, man. A bad belief. All right, man. well, so HelloFresh, right? It's a meal service company we work with that's really great. Helps you avoid all that meal planning and shopping and shopping, right? But uh, they've got... And so they got like a family-friendly menu for back-to-school season. You know, that's fine. Mm. Uh, they've got yeah. they've got some nice uh, seasonal stuff. Pumpkin cinnamon rolls, you know, Thanksgiving stuff, right? All that stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a much healthier option. They got 50 menu and market items to choose from each week. They got vegetarian meals. They got calorie smart choices. Maybe you're looking for that. They got gourmet options. Everyone, something for everyone. They got recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts. So they ensure deliciousness and simplicity. Bring, bring, bring. So someone's calling. Uh, let me put you on hold there, uh, Otis. What's up? No, let's do conference call, man. All right, I'll conference you in. All right. Uh, hello? Hey, man. Hey, who's this? Obadiah Stane, man. Obadiah Stane? I thought you were killed in, a, in an altercation with Iron Man. Nah, it's a multiverse, man. I'm looking for something I can make out of a box of scraps, man. <laughs> so you realized <laughs> halfway through this ad read. Okay. Well, Obadiah, hello, Fresh. I've been talking about him. And, you know, Otis here could probably fill you in a little bit. That's uh, Bad Blake's real name. Um, yeah, hey, but... man. How's it going, man? I'm good, man. How are you, man? Nice to see you, man. Been too long, man. <laughs> Electrifying. Uh, hello, Fresh. Look, it's really good. It's 30% cheaper than shopping at grocery stores. They got pre portioned ingredients. You're not going to have excess food that ends up going in the trash. It's a box of scraps, but these are good scraps. And you can easily customize your order on the app within minutes. So you can change your delivery day, your food preferences, your plan size. You can skip a week if you want to. It's really easy uh, to use. Bring, bring. All right, who we got? Uh, click, hello. Hey, man. Hey, what's up? It's Kevin Flynn, man. Kevin Flynn from Tron. Uh, yeah, do they deliver to the grid? Hello, fresh. I'm sure they do. They're really, really good at at getting the package to you quickly. And Kevin, if you go to hellofresh.com slash 14 check and use code 14 check, you'll get up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. That's hellofresh.com slash 14 check, code 14 check, up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Let me try going to that website right now, man. Let me give it some biodigital jazz. Are you going to get on a light cycle? Yeah, I have to ride a light cycle to a website. <laughs> to get to a website. Uh, it's America's number one meal kit. It's been great to talk to all you guys. Uh, Hello, Fresh. My pleasure. Truly, anytime. Welcome me back, and I'll be here, man. Starman. The film Starman. Michael uh, Douglas. Stars. Michael Douglas wants to be in it and he moves on michael douglas is kind of the king of getting locked in permanently as producer on movies he ends up not starring in like he yeah. uh has a fucking producer credit on face off because he was at one point gonna do it with harrison ford and i think he still is grandfathered into the new face off they're doing oh yeah good for michael douglas i would have watched that face off michael douglas and harrison would have been a cool face it. off but what if it was the exact same movie yeah. with those two guys? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm imagining yeah, like Michael who? Douglas. 
Yeah. Right. Who's who? I guess Ford is Castro Douglas Troy. has to be right. Douglas has to be the villain. Right. No, Ford is Castor. Right. Well, see, the thing with Face Off is they actually kind of play both characters. It's very right. confusing. Yeah. Guys. It's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, you, I, I guess you cast Michael Douglas as Castor Troy at the beginning. Right. At the beginning. Which, which mm-hmm. then means the you have Harrison guy. Ford playing that for the rest of the movie, which would have been interesting. Yeah. Hey, let's do it. Let's it would have been compelling. It. Uh, it's not too this, late. This remains the only Academy Award nomination that any Carpenter movie has gotten. Is that true? Not even a tech nom for Correct. any of the other ones? Correct. That wow. is bananas. That's so... I. That's, that's crazy. And that is crazy. Crazy. Carpenter is obviously Sorry. like, uh, you know, ghettoized a little bit into the genre thing, but like Bridges is very respected. Uh, and I think that's a lot of it. This movie like underperformed a little bit, but I think people just sort of thought this performance was so undeniable. But it's also kind of surprising that this movie didn't get other nominations. You'd think it would get a visual effects nomination or whatever. That's all, or you right? Could see, like you could absolutely yeah. see this being a screenplay nom, even Score, with the misinterpretation. Right, right, right. I think Karen Allen absolutely should have been nominated. Yeah. Right, but she's—that's the kind of thing they ignore because they're like, yes. well, "Are you a suffering wife in a period drama?" No, you know. Uh, but uh, wait, who are the visual effects nominees? Because now I got to say, yeah, that's what I'm what looking they, up right now too. Here. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Ghostbusters in 2010. Those are three good looking movies. Yeah. I mean, I, that's fine. Yeah, that's I can't solid. really argue with huh. that. It's, you know, the problem with these tech nods that we're like, I can't believe it's like, well, they only did three nods, you know, for visual yeah. effects for makeup. So, and the sound ones don't even totally exist, you know? So, yeah. And when you yeah, look at I something getting snubbed in the 1980s and you're like, how is that possible? You look at the three things that were nominated and you're like, oh, three revolutionary films that are historic. Right. Cool looking movies. So, but yeah, Karen Allen is so good in this movie. Obviously, Bridges has the showy performance. It's a great performance. I love Jeff Bridges. But she is incredible in this. But yeah, it doesn't work without her. Like, and yeah, and, and what's yeah. the what's the Karen Allen? So like it's this is two years after Raiders, but like what what's going on for her? Because I don't know much about her non-Indiana Jones career. The, the thing that that Nick and JJ pulled up is that a she was kind of I uh, uh, you know notable at the time, especially because it's like her first movie is Animal House, right? Like her first yep. film is this seismic thing, and then a couple years later she's in Raiders, which is like the biggest fucking blockbuster, and she becomes this like this character and performance that everyone tries to copy for decades. Um, mm-hmm. but she was, I think, kind of uninterested in playing the movie star game and would like at her peak go like, no, I'm going to go do a play mm-hmm. and, and would just go back to theater. They had to like talk her into this movie. And, and she obviously like thinks fondly of this movie. These interviews they found where like, uh, you know, she, she likes the role. She likes the challenge of the movie or whatever, but she read the script and she liked the script. So she s- decided to do it. But the way she talks about it is that, like, every other script she was reading, she was saying no. And they must have been big mm-hmm. scripts. The other thing is, she said she read the script. She likes Carpenter. She likes Bridges. She thinks the script's great. And she's like, I don't think I can do this. And they were like, you like it. And she was like, this is going to be really difficult to pull off. And she, like, had her whole logic that was sound of, like, this movie's going to be really hard to execute if you just have a human actor not a robot or a puppet or makeup, right? A guy who looks like a guy playing an alien. It's going to be goofy. It's going to be hard for that performance to work. This character is this woman who's in like catatonic shock the entire movie. She like pointedly has to spend 75% of the running time having no chemistry with the only person she shares scenes with. Like she knew (laughs) the movie was going to be hard to pull off and it was going to be a hard performance to pull off. And they sort of had to talk her into like, come on, like take the risk. Right. Yeah. Good, good call. It's a huge risk. Yeah. Have either of you ever seen the Glass Menagerie that Paul Newman did that she's in? No. No. But I feel like I really should. Yeah. Like, I love Glass Menagerie, and she feels like very interesting uh, uh, Laura casting. Is it like a like a film stage play, basically? Or is I mean, it, it more it, it w- cinematic? It wasn't, but I think it's a little stagey by reputation. I mean, it's weird because no one ever talks about it and you're like, 
it feels like a Glass Menagerie movie with Johan Woodward directed by Paul Newman should be somewhat legendary unless it's a... With John Malkovich as yes. Tom? That's, that's wild. Right, and it's like, so either that movie is great or it's a disaster and people are like, mm, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm learning from Karen Allen's Wikipedia page that her son won a Chopped competition in 2016. She's got a handsome son who looks a lot like Karen Allen. And is a chef. Mm-hmm. Good jeans. Who's her? Who's her? Uh, who's her husband? Kale Brown. I see. She married Kale Brown. He was a, a soap opera yeah. actor, I think, primarily. Yeah. yeah. I mean, her. It's not like she stopped ever, ever stopped doing movies. Hell, she's in in the bedroom in which yeah, Sissy Spacek famously <laughs> Sissy Spacek plate. throwing those dishes is everywhere we look. But I also think I I think she's someone who doesn't work for the sake of working, and she's pretty comfortable no. like taking years off. She does theater. I know she. Uh, taught acting for a long time, and I'm forgetting at which college. Bard? Maybe she taught at Bard? That sounds like something, sh- that sounds like her vibe. Yeah. Right? Like this kind of, let's see, uh, let's see, she knows she, hmm. hmm. Wikipedia says she's taught at Bard. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about like a woman who like breaks out in Raiders, which is a movie that's gonna be famous for Harrison Ford. Like she's like, Breaks out as the woman in the movie opposite a man. Like, I'm thinking about Kathleen Turner breaking out and, like, romancing a stone around the time. Like, she has... I think Kathleen Turner has a more of a star career, yeah. but, like, there's there's not a lot of routes to take at that time. No, I, I mean, no. yes. It, it It's, like, an unfortunate reality, but it is particularly bizarre only because everyone was like, oh, Marion Ravenwood is now the ideal. That's the archetype yeah. for all of these movies. That's the performance that everyone's trying to emulate. That's the writing of the character that everyone's trying to emulate. I think to some degree, she felt a little bit uh, like like writers was overshadowing her career. I mean, there's a quote they pulled up here where she just sort of said, like, I think this role is as good as writers. I wish it would have as much of an impact on my career. You know, like I, I mean, I, agree. Right. I, I wish it wasn't that one role in that one character. So it's like. On one hand, yes, like what were her opportunities? What was she being offered at this point in time? What were people going to let her do? But on the other hand, I bet she turned down like four obvious kind of Raider ripoff roles. That, but also feel like she must have turned down like comedies because she does none. Right. Uh, Until Scrooged. Until Scrooged and Animal Behavior, which is right. Like clearly it takes her a long time. Like. You'd think someone would want to put her in like a rom com or something. I and know she that's... starts out with Animal House. Like she starts out with one of the most successful yeah. comedies ever. I think she just does shit her own way. Like she just kind of doesn't care. Was there ever a time where she was going to be in another Indiana Jones until Crystal Skull, or was it always just like that? That this is serial. You're you're out. It's weird yeah. that she's not in Last Crusade. Yes. Yeah. You know, doing That's the, the prequel I, I route like was thinking she was somehow for Temple of Doom, you know, was the choice they made. And like, you know, there's logic to that. But like, it's a little weird. But wasn't the prequel decision also based on him not wanting to do Nazis again? Or is that apocryphal? I can't, I can't remember when it is he doesn't want to do Nazis again. There is some. He's gone through a couple of phases Nazis of not wanting to do Nazis. Again. Right. Right. Um, because then he obviously doubles back on that with Last Crusade. But is she in the new Indiana Jones? I guess she- She's it, not. She can't be right because yeah. then you'd have to you'd have to bring in fucking mud again, <laughs> right? But but it's also they really like, saddled they her with mud. I know, I know. You could just ignore him. <laughs> Where's mud? I don't know. It is weird that the fourth <laughs> one adult, can live his own life. ends with like all the pomp and circumstance of their wedding, and I am dreading the new movie starting with like, yeah, well, ever since Mary had passed. And him, like, yeah, tearfully yeah. stroking the framed photo. <sighs> like, I just don't want to see that. No. I don't want to see that either, but that does seem pretty plausible. Karen Allen was yeah. interested in reprising her role as Marion Ravenwood, noting that Jones and Marion were married in the previous film, so it would be difficult, I think, to move forward without her. And uh, they never uh, reached out. They don't uh, clarify, right, yeah. Anyway, uh, she's great in King of the Hill. If people haven't seen that, the Soderbergh movie. Uh, she's great in uh, The Perfect Storm, which I love. The Perfect Storm is kind of you know, has her and Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio yeah. on like, you know, like sort of and Cherry Jones. And like it's got these these kind of flinty ladies sort of mixed in. I really like that. I like her when she shows up in something is what I'm saying. But this is sort of her last, I guess, Big Scrooge movie. Counts, star. Yeah, Scrooge. But Scrooge, Scrooge, she's not like on the poster. You know, no, that's a Bill Murray movie. Not a super exciting role, but she is the no, female it's a lead sucky in that. Sucky role. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But then, yeah, this is a vehicle for her, even as much as it is for Jeff. Yeah, Bridges. it's not more. And not a show. He's got the showier part, but it's really her movie in so many ways. You know, I mean, it's it's certainly yep. her story. Um, David, you saw who uh, nearly played this role uh, for Carpenter, right? Um, wait, remind me because I did read another the- actor you love who I think would have been fundamentally wrong for this, Kevin Bacon. Oh, oh, for Starman. Sorry, I thought yeah. we were on Kevin. Karen- no. Oh, no, sorry. I did see that. I think he would be great. Uh, in this movie, and I do love Kevin Bacon, uh, and I understand why they wanted him because at that point we're only a few years from like Footloose and stuff. Carpenter wanted him for Christine, and he chose Footloose instead. And then Footloose makes him a movie star. So then Carpenter wanted him for this, and he almost did it. How old is Kevin Bacon at this point, though? Young. W- when the movie, yeah, he would have been like He's he like would have been baby. like twenty eight or whatever. Not a baby, Not but you know, but. Maybe 26, actually. He, he's pretty young. But the thing, he's so beautiful. Like, especially back then, he was just this incredibly beautiful-looking person. And I feel like that's part of what uh, Carpenter's probably thinking of. It's like, you want this guy to kind of look like a baby, right? Sure. He, like, even though he's her husband and all that, he also is brand new, and so he should be kind of shiny and perfect-looking. And Bridges is a great... You know, they 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 came to a great actor for it because yeah. he's got the angles to the face. He's very very clean looking. They obviously you know they style him just right. But I I get the bacon thing. I get it. But, but that's part of it. Like ba- bacon is so much more extreme looking that I think he reads more obviously alien. Where there's something very gentle about Bridges' handsomeness in a in a somewhat unassuming way. You know, just, and you need him to look like a guy who lived in the woods yes, of Wisconsin. Yes, you know, like yes. he's an alien, but he's in this this human body. A little right. You need you know the shoulders. You need some some. Shoulders. He's got to wear that uh, that check plaid. It's also just like it's the, you know Jeff Bridges' miracle shit, where you're like the the most valuable part of his casting is how quickly the clips you're seeing projected from the home video footage she has of him sets up who this guy was. That you're not going to really get to spend any time with the real dude and you need like sort of fly on the wall photography in the background that immediately gives you a sense of the dude. With Bridges is just so direct, you know, and unfussy and and natural. Unpretentious. Yes. Yes. You know who I saw who also was up for this is uh, or at least Carpenter talked to Tom Cruise. That makes a lot of but sense. But that Tom Cruise ended up doing Legend. Now, yeah. here's the thing about Tom Cruise. He would have been great because he is an alien that's just on mm-hmm. our planet. Yeah. So it would yeah. have been like, you yeah. know, method acting for him, if anything. Tom Cruise might have been too good. Like it might have it might have <laughs> unbalanced the movie. But <laughs> one, once again, though, Tom Cruise at this point, he's still pretty young. Yeah. Little baby. alien looking, like you say, he's being a baby Cruise. Mm-hmm. And you know, like you said, you know, Bridges again, you know, yeah, you could see that guy sawing a log, you know? Right. And I don't right. mean sleeping. I yep. don't mean snoring. <laughs> honk shoe, honk shoe. <laughs> was, I mean, what are they doing in the, are they fishing in those videos? Like they're out like at a campsite yeah, and he's or like something. playing what, folk there's... songs on a fucking acoustic guitar. All of it, like he just, he sells that stuff so much. Whereas with Tom Cruise, you'd be like, he won't be able to pull off that. Yeah. He will pull off being an alien who doesn't understand how people work. But the fact that Bridges is able to do both so economically is uh, what is so effective here. Um, I, I, you know, that we I, it's like hard not to just repeat ourselves here, but there's something about just like how fucking classical and patient Carpenter's filmmaking is, you know, like just the way he lets things play out and his comfort with silence and, you know, slow camera movements and all this shit that like really sets up this movie beautifully. Uh, where after you have your like, you know, prolonged Carpenter credit rollout, you just have a woman in like, you know, a, a pretty dull state of grief, which uh, we talked about in our thing episode, how like there are very few horror movies that feature that little screaming where people do not like yell in terror when scary things happen. And this similarly is a movie where like, here is a woman who is in intense levels of grief who then goes into like a very terrifying high stakes situation that she cannot comprehend. And he does not ever reduce her to histrionics, you know? Yeah. She, she goes into shock, but in a very 
like in a very realistic sort way. of real, you know, uh, right. relatable. Exactly. Yeah. Right. There's something yeah. even just to the fact that, it, you know, there isn't a scene 10 minutes in where she goes, so you're an alien. Like you just, mm-hmm. he avoids all those tropes of people overreacting to things, understanding things too quickly. The whole way it all plays out for her. I mean, even just that moment where she says, I'm, I'm going to fuck up the exact line, but she goes like, you idiot, like, don't stay up watching this. Uh-huh. Don't do this to yourself. Right. It's like such a, a an actual realistic moment of a person talking to themselves, which is usually such a storytelling device in movies that reads as a device, right? Right. And it's like, that's mm-hmm. the way that people actually talk to themselves, especially if you're secluded in a cabin in the middle of the woods, like grieving a loss, trying to stay sane. You just go like, you fucking idiot. Don't keep doing this, you know? But don't forget it opens with the uh, all the Voyager stuff right. you know, before you get mm-hmm. to that. I don't know if we're going in chronological order, but there's like some real like show off the outer space stuff before you get there, which I I was curious for you guys to put me in the context of like what Carpenter's doing at this point with effects, because like obviously the big effects come pretty soon after that. But it's very like, woo space before you get to her. People also so pumped up about Voyager 2 back then, like still. I feel this, like, right? this is my other question is like, is Voyager 2 just like the hottest shit in yeah. the planet yeah. still in 84? Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's got a fucking golden disc yeah. on it. I don't know if you know that, but also by 19, you know, by 1984, when this movie's coming out, it hasn't even reached Neptune yet. Like right. Voyager 2 still, you know, shooting through the solar system. It's gone past Jupiter and Saturn or whatever. Like, but like, you know, it's 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 an active thing. Voyager 2 is having the best week ever. That's what you're trying to say. <laughs> Wait, where is it now? Now it is. I believe it is slightly because Voyager won, but it's beyond the uh, the termination shock. You know, it's beyond our Wait, solar I'm system. I'm sorry. What's up? The termination <laughs> shock. Ben. Ben, uh-huh. ben looks like he just met the love of his life, except it was a term. The termination shock, which is the kind of term oh, that feels wow. like some band should be using as a name. Ben's is glowing. Like, is what? like the the scientific term for when um the solar wind like is no longer like what you know like when when you're beyond our solar system, basically. Yeah. Did you know we had our um, yeah. longest radio silence with Voyager 2 in 30 years in 2020? Like, and then it, it, it cut off, then it it cut off communication up. with Voyager 2 in March 2020. I'm not saying wow. that it caused anything bad to happen, uh, but maybe it did. Mm, don't like it. What are you up to, Voyager 2? But yeah, Ben, it's just, it's just fucking out there shooting into nowhere, basically. Uh, and it's going to... St- it's going to die pretty soon. I hey. think I think it has a f- sad. It has a few years left of power, but I do think eventually, you know, it will because it's, but yeah, it's, it's way out there. Pretty cool. Huh? That yes. Is fucking Someone cool. will find it. Maybe it's got a disc on it. It's got a cool. And that's what, you know, when, when Starman arrives, he starts just reciting things from the disc. He does the Kurt Waldheim speech and he, does, you know, like he's just, he's just uh, repeating our words back to us. Yep. Um, this, this is one of the Carpenter movies that he, uh, did not score. You yeah. have this score that is a lot more emotional than most of his yeah, it's films. it's a good score. Uh, it is, uh. Very 80s. It's very 80s. It's a very 80s, uh, sort of synthy theme. Um, but, uh, I, I, I think he is so smart about when he uses it and using it pretty sparingly and not overplaying it. And this whole extended sequence of the Starman transforming, you know, him scanning the apartment, all that stuff. The fact that it plays in such an eerie silence. Uh, I mean, because you have, you know, you're, you're grounding yourself in the emotionality of this character. You're setting up the Challenger, uh, the Voyager 2 stuff, rather, not the Challenger stuff. Then I think you go to the sort of Starman POV sequence, right? Which goes on for a while. The point of view is trying to say that it's energy, right? Yeah, it's never kind right? of clear, but the form is essentially just energy. Yeah, it's not like any kind of physical shape, I don't think. Because the movement is weird, too, and hard to define. He is a, a non-corporeal being, as far as I could you know, right, figure. Cool. But he's got, he carries those balls with him somehow. Yeah. Those silver. He's got seven balls. silver balls. Seven silver yeah. balls. Uh, and yeah, and he's a little bibby. 
when he comes out and he's freaky looking. Yeah. Uh, and I don't like it. It's bizarre. Um, oh my God. Yeah, it's like a bad trip. That's like too much acid right there. Yeah. It's it's like a very it's it's an example of the limitations of the special effects technology at the time helping the movie. Right? right. Mm-hmm. Like it it adds to the weird alien otherworldly factor. Um, I, my, my zoom background is I will make sure that, uh, Marie posts this on social media, uh, an auction from six years ago where they auctioned off the original baby prop where all of the skin has rotted off it. It's and worse it, for wear. It looks like <laughs> really a fucking awful. Jan Svankmeyer nightmare. It is <laughs> so bizarre. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, David, we've talked about Annette a bunch and baby, oh, baby Annette, Annette in that and how uh, horrifying it is. And I, there were some real baby Annette vibes in that transformation sequence. Baby, I mean, baby Annette, who we stand, obviously. We baby love. Annette. Great, um, great musician. Yes, that's the first movie I saw coming back from paternity leave. So for like first day back at work, I went to see Annette uh, at a screening. And I really, it really unsettled me. This well, did layers. not unsettle me as much. Because um, you see the baby for a second and I'm like, and then, you know, then it's a a face that's sort of going like the weirdness of the way the baby turns its head and like makes direct eye contact with her. And they give the baby these like intense piercing eyes. Uh, It's upsetting. Yes. And then, right. Then it then it turns into like blobby. Right. Uh, Yes. And then it's like a boy. Oh, there's that shot. Yes. Which is very like American werewolf in London. Where the the body is stretching out, yeah, right. And, you know, to sort of to sort of you you know uh, conti- get the effect. It's I remember noticing in the credits, like it was like three big names credited yes. for the visual effects. It's and I don't remember which ones they were. Uh, yeah, Stan Winston, Rick Baker, and Dick Smith. Yeah, three big yeah. boys. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's like it's like yeah, it's like the three like wise men of visual effects of the eighties. It it right, and it's Carpenter being like, "Look, Columbia is giving me twenty million dollars. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna hire, the, hire best. the best people, right?" But you also have to imagine, like, here's a guy who's like made himself, uh, you know, one of the premier sort of uh, visual effects directors of his generation, and then now he's making this alien movie. Those three names are attached to it, and in the first like ten minutes, you have uh, the Voyager two. Uh, you know, these shots of space at the beginning of the film and then this wild transformation. And the rest of the movie is like so terrestrial by and large, you know? Yeah, like the visual effects are much more sparing. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, there's stuff. He uses his glowing balls and, you know. Of course. Well, he's like, he's going to he's he's gonna make the creature and he's going to film in Monument Valley and then that's the budget. Like anything else is gravy. Right, apart from that, it's a road trip movie. There's a whole like, 20 minutes at a diner you know like that was his whole thing that's... was he was like i want to make like two for the road i want to make it happens one night that's the thing that's appealing yeah. to me in this script is that's two people in a car getting to know each other yeah and it's got the it happen one night thing where like the people he meets they meet along the way like there are characters there are there are lives that they are interacting with and like i was thinking about it happened one night i was thinking about some jonathan demi something movies wild that you guys did a little yes. while ago a similar where, vibe. Yep. yeah about uh-huh. something yeah just like that like the, there's a world like the guy who um Jeff Bridges hitches a ride with you like, yeah, my daughter's going to college, costs an arm and a leg. Like there's a whole world within that one conversation that really takes the time for it. I think you also, with no disrespect to them, uh, all the people we listed have made movies that I like. But I think you go through that list of the other directors who considered making this movie. And I think a lot of them would have turned a lot of the people they meet along the way into more kind of like comedic archetypes. Yeah, mm-hmm. or villain, straight villainous, or whatever. Right. right, would have been right. Right, exactly. There, there is kind of a, a a quiet humanity that everyone is given in this film, you know. And even the the fucking venison guy who tries to beat up Jeff Bridges is not played as like a buffoon. Yeah, I mean that guy has some legitimate concerns, sure. such as where did my deer go? And Jeff Bridges is like, he shot over that there. deer fair square. No, it's gone. <laughs> Even the uh, the Tar Heels causing a ruckus at the motel, right. like you know, they won the game. Right. You get yeah. it, uh, and I I think that helps the movie a lot because you're you're sort of seeing everyone they meet through the star man's eyes, where he's just so fascinated by all human behavior, you know. And what I like about him is, he, of course, he's childlike in that he doesn't know anything and he's learning, right? But like, he's not innocent, or he's not like completely benevolent and he doesn't think well of everyone yeah he's just sort of neutral he's just kind of interested to see what everyone's going to do next like 
And there is a slight edge to him where you're like, maybe he is going to pull a trigger when he he has the gun. You know what I mean? Like, you don't entirely... Mm -hmm. He's not like this, like, sweet, entirely sweet childlike figure, which is No, but that's a a balance inherent in Bridges that I think with, like, Cruz or Bacon, it could have swayed too much in one direction or the other. And I also think those guys being, like, 10 years younger than Bridges, the fact that Bridges is more of an adult man acting like a baby gives the movie a lot of power. I just want to say, just fucking Bridges' performance, like... there's something about his lack of vanity and how comfortable he is with the goofiness required in this role without playing it for laughs. It's like what Karen Allen said, where it's like, how is any actor going to pull this off? It's going to make them look so fucking silly. And Bridges is just sort of so unselfconscious in like all of the weirdness of this guy, you know, moving like a baby, but also like a robot, you know? Mm-hmm. And enough that he becomes sexy at a point in the movie where, like, the fact that there's a sex scene is like, there's definitely a part of me that's like, is this the right thing to do? Like, is this a good idea for anybody involved? But also, like, it's Jeff Bridges. He's hot enough that it works. Forky made a face at me during the sex scene being like, you know, basically asked, like, really? And I'm like, it's her husband. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She wants to be with him. Like, you know, beyond the connection she's formed with this new being and all that, like, it's her fucking husband is living and breathing. Like it's sort of, she, there's a temptation there. Like I will beyond... say, I think it's maybe a mild failing of the movie that I don't think they, the, the way the sex scene plays out feels a little more standard off the rack. A little and 80s, yeah. A little 80s. And it also makes it feel like, especially the, the build up to it happening of just like, oh, we're on this train. We're too close to each other. We're looking at each other, all this sort of shit. It feels like you lose the star man in it a little bit. I, I kind of feel like her. It, obviously, you keep the emotional context in mind of this is her husband. It's one last chance, this and that. But it does feel like that scene is a little divorced from that emotional uh, pitch. I don't know. It's pretty clinical. Yeah, and it's sort of like, you know, what isn't the Terminator? The Terminator is this year. That's a movie where it's like when the sex scene kicks off, you're like, am I watching the same movie? You know, this is just kind of like straight out of Skinamax or whatever. You know, it's just kind of like a yeah. bog standard. Yeah, Right. It's it's not as bad as that, but this feels like it's from a different film. And there is a version of this in which the sex scene is the most emotionally devastating scene in the movie. Right, you would. Yeah. Because there's a, right, it's a loaded thing that's right. going on. There's a yeah. lot of potency there, and it just sort of feels like, well, how do you shoot a love scene with two pretty people? Fucking in a bale of yeah. hay in a train car. Like some hobos. Yeah, empty train car, except for conveniently placed bale yeah. of hay. But it happened one night, bale of True. hay scene uh, in the middle of the movie. So it's a, maybe it's an homage. Sure. I'm sure that was, that was a conscious uh, homage. Yeah. That's like the 12 foot club or something. Right. And Ben, <laughs> but on a pail of hay or something. <laughs> there's something there. Uh-huh. There's something there. Ben, ben, you have tried to talk about having sex on a train on this podcast <laughs> multiple Correct. times. You tried yeah. to. You tried to get yeah to to coin the Mile High Club essentially version. You won't drop yes. this. Yeah. Yeah. No, you won't, won't drop. It. I refuse. Straw style. Yeah. So it's the twelve. It's the twelve foot club straw style. <laughs> 12, 12 foot club straw style almost sounds like a waffle house order it's like yeah, exactly. what is this it's like, what, that's peppers <laughs> right. peppers and ham I, anyway um star man star man the the transformation sequence i know we're jumping all around but the transformation sequence is so indebted to uh american werewolf in so many ways which is obviously this breakthrough and like oh you're not cutting around You're showing these things that people thought you could never show on screen before through like clever editing and different practical devices and all this sort of shit. And there's an interview that Bridges did where he said, like, this scene is going to blow people's minds. You watch a baby turn into like an adult me and it's all in one unbroken shot. And I don't know if he misunderstood or that was their plan and it could not be executed. But I do think it is smart that they keep on cutting back to like, the back of the head, her reactions, grounding it, not having anything too absurd happen, letting it uh, play out fairly slowly, you know? And silently. Like, she is completely silent through right, the whole the thing. Right, the silent sort of shock that she's in this whole movie. Yeah. And I, 
Right. Especially for like the first 40 minutes of this movie when she's really right. Like it would be if he just gracefully, you know, turned into like a beam of light and then just sort of took form. Right. Or whatever, you know, like you can imagine much more sort of sanitary versions of this transformation. The whole movie doesn't make sense anymore. Like it needs to be a little freaky and a little kind of like not like not like he's stealing the body but like you know it just needs to be kind of physical and gross yes for... yes it's like an invasion of privacy in so many ways yeah he's not like an astral projection he is like a like dna flesh and blood it's kind creature. of crucial it feels like a carpenter thing although maybe it was in the script i don't know but yeah but also just the fact that it's like okay here's this woman in this like catatonic state of grief then suddenly she walks into her living room and there's like a baby with adult eyes staring into her soul, right? What the fuck is this? Then she watches it grow and transform, which is already going to be the freakiest shit she's ever witnessed in her life. And then it turns into her dead husband. Like just sort of like the absolute insanity of what she is witnessing, you know? Then it talks in an alien language, which I really think is great and subtle too. But like, yeah, how how are you going to react? Like you're in a total shock. You must just right. be in total fucking shock. Right. And she and she's in like the the shock uh phase of her grief as well. Like she's just like you you have to imagine to some degree she questions whether she's having a mental breakdown or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean she wakes up from uh initially and it's like that was the weirdest dream. I mean, classic. 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 Uh, classic reaction, but I, I, I understand it. I want to point out something that interests me that I is in the dossier. This movie is shot by John, Donald Morgan, who shot Christine. It is not shot by Dean Cundey. Uh, I do correct. think this movie would be, would be better if it was shot by Dean Cundey. Just all I think movies Dean would Cundey be better. Would absolutely, shot by Dean Cundey. fucking rip this thing off. <laughs> yeah. he, I mean, like he would just <laughs> and I. This is the same year that Cundy does Romancing the Stone. Romancing this the is stone. now he's in bed with Zemeckis. And that's going to take him through the better part of the Right. Year. He's yeah. going to come back to do Big Trouble in Little China. But Oh, I forgot. Um, okay. He does do that. But but this is a very interesting little tidbit, a salty uh, yeah. little quote mm-hmm. from John Carpenter, who by and large, all of the quotes JJ and Nick found, uh, him talking about this movie, he's very, very pleasant about it. He seems to have really enjoyed making it. He seems very proud of it. Uh, they're at, they ask him, why no Dean Cundy? And he says, we've had a parting of the ways. It may only be temporary, but we've had a few problems. However, Dean's work is excellent. There's no doubt about that. We make a good team. The look of my pictures from Halloween through the thing is beautiful. He did a terrific job shooting Romancing the Stone last year. But before we could ever work together again, we would have to clear up some attitude problems. Yeah. Whoa. You know, fucking... John Carpenter, the angry nun wrapping yeah. Dean Cundy on the rule, the, yeah. the, the, the knuckles with the ruler. Uh, I don't know. So it, clearly a little salty. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder. Anyway. I wonder. Yeah. That's just, it's just because this movie looks great. It's a good looking movie. Like, but I just, he, it's so Dean Cundy, it's so ready for him, you know, that sort of sentimentality and like all the lights and the blues and the, you know, it would be great. Okay. Cundy also just looks so cuddly. You you imagine him being such a, a sweetheart. And then Carpenter's like this squiggly guy. He's like smoking and he's like, he's got attitude problems. Right. Like- <laughs> but I did, I mean, I will say, I you know, I don't want to speak out of school, but I did hear there were similar problems, uh, sort of uh, attitude issues between him and Garfield, which is why he didn't come back for Tale of Two Kitties. He shot the first Garfield movie. Is that? Yeah, is that I guess true? that's that only so? funny if you have that as <laughs> you know the top of your noggin, which <laughs> speaks to the way my brain works. Where I'm like, yeah, everyone knows that Dean Cundy <laughs> shot Garfield the movie, but not the sequel. It's taught in film school. It is taught in film school. The Griff film school. Bring, bring, bring. Uh, click. Hello. Hey, hello. Uh, hello. Who's this? Hey, man. It's. Sheriff Marcus Hamilton, man. Uh, Sheriff Marcus Hamilton. So you're from Hell or High Water, right? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, how are you doing, buddy? Out there on the border, you know, stopping bank robbers. I'm okay. Yeah, you're really gravel voice from what I remember. Yeah. <laughs> ring, uh, ring, well, ring. <laughs> wow, this phone, it sounds gravelly. 
<laughs> Is there some grapple in the phone? <laughs> Click, hello? <laughs> All right, is this Rooster Cogburn? Yeah, it is, man. <laughs> uh, Rooster, you're a busy guy, right? Very, yeah. It's, <laughs> so I know you, <laughs> you sure do. So you my should just stop. Guns. I've been wearing my long johns for 15 years, man. <laughs> you gotta, I know, the problem is you don't want to think about what to wear, okay? You should just embrace the radically efficient Mac Weldon daily wear system, okay? It's a selection of clothes rooted in smart design made with performance fabrics built to work together. Breathable t-shirts and polos, stylish button-ups and shorts, underwear and beyond. Mack Weldon's going to make it easy for you to dress for work, leisure, and play wherever your summer takes you, Rooster. I don't know. Where is it taking bing, you? Bing, bing. Okay, click. Hello? Hey, man. <laughs> okay, who we got? Who's this? It's Roy. Uh, who's that? I'm sorry. I'm Are you from... I'm the rest of the police <laughs> department. Man. <laughs> So you guys are th- all working hard because, you know, Roy... I'm dead. I'm buried in the, the clothes I died in, man. I need some new underwear, man. You're all, uh, you know, law enforcement professionals of some sort. Yeah, man. you got a U.S. Yeah. Marshal, an R.I.P.D. <laughs> Look, Mack Weldon, they've been sponsoring us since the beginning. They're essential for underwear shirts for me. I, I just know exactly what uh, I'm getting from them. I know it's going to fit well. I know it's going to look good. anti microbial it's going to last, okay? And so it makes it really easy to just not have to worry about what you're wearing. Uh, for the Ultimate Lazy Sunday, they've got these Ace Sweat Shorts that pair really well with their Pima tees. Uh, you know, they've got the Silver Knit Polo and Radius Shorts, a very high-tech combo for weekend travel, stuff like that. Look. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, my God. You got to buy some time this summer with the Mack Weldon Daily Wear System. So for 20% off your first order, visit Mack Weldon dot com slash check and enter promo code check that's macweldon.com slash check promo code check for 20 percent off mac weldon radically efficient wardrobing you guys are gonna look great bang, bang, bang. Oh, oh boy rooster is your phone ringing okay i'll pick it up hello it didn't sound like a phone being picked up uh click hello hello <laughs> hello what's up Are you from? I don't know. Who are you? Sorry. Seventh son. <laughs> I forgot about that one. They always forget about me. <laughs> they sure do. I think everyone tried to forget about you. Well, you can hey. go to Mac Weldon too. MacWeldon.com yeah, slash check. You can get 20% off your uh, first order. Okay. Bye, man. <laughs> bye. So they go on a road trip. I love road trips, guys. I love a road trip movie. I love, uh, you know, uh, the sort of uh, damp American, you know, Midwest. Like, I love just, like, the, the, Those truck the stops, atmosphere. Man. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I've never been to a truck stop that had, like, booths and pies. And I got... I, I, part of me feels like they don't exist, and part of me feels like I'm just taking the wrong road trips. Oh, no, they exist. I've been to some truck stops in my day. They got casinos, KD. They got fucking everything, man. Oh, I've I've seen some video poker. I I know I know my way around those. And, you know the ones with the showers and everything. But like that Dutch apple pie. They have video looked- games there where you can drive a truck. <laughs> Just what you want to do while you're yeah. <laughs> or while you're or you can watch Iros Ice Road Trucker. You could do either of those things while at the truck stop. It's pretty cool. Just Karen Allen crushes that diner order. What oh. does she get him? She gets herself a burger and, and they, you know, she gets two malted milkshakes or whatever. Right. Dutch she apple gets pie. two slices of apple pie. Forget what she gets him now. I'm trying Deviled to like, egg sandwich. The whole... Deviled egg sandwich. What the yes. hell is that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> that sounds great. But it sounds good. I mean, it's a it's deviled egg smush on a sandwich or like egg salad, but with mustard in it. And paprika? I'm 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 into whatever. I'm into it. I know Griff is mm. not into what, it. But. What a, what amount of paprika on the sandwich? <laughs> it I should mean, have a little. I would oh, say a little. Wait, <laughs> shit. These are double Dan, David, that is a sandwich that has paprika on it. Yeah, that was it's the official. joke I was making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you realized that? Hey, yes, I realized it. That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> ben swing it in 10 seconds later. And then he asked why you can't eat the apple pie first. And he's right. 
her right explaining that he can't eat the pie first, and then you're like, well, you know, he let him eat the pie. Yeah, well, I just love yeah, he man. says why, and she goes, I, I don't know, that's just the way things are done. <laughs> like I love that She's kind of wrong. thing, right? But it's like I, I'm, I'm sure. Katie, you've experienced this a thousand times now, but I feel like I had that conversation with my parents all the time where I'd be like, why? And they'd be like, I, I don't know. It just d- just do it that way. Yeah. No, there are so many like raising small children things in this. And like you're like, it's not like he's childlike. It's just like kind of like stating the plain question. And you're just like, I didn't really think about it that yeah. way. I, I guess that's how this works. And then they both eat the pie. It looks like it's terrific. I just want to read this uh, uh, Karen Allen quote. I was talking before about her hesitation signing on to the movie, but she said, I, I thought Starman was also extremely risky professionally and creatively. The idea of it being a human being as opposed to a Muppet or a mechanical creature playing an alien, trying to do it realistically, as opposed to one of those science fiction spoofs where it's just a monster walking around or you got a man working some strange puppet to keep that reality going for the both of us. To be able to play that all the way through a four-month shoot and to do it well and believably was quite a challenge. Which, when you think about it, it does make you realize how much of a challenge that is for her as well. To constantly play mm-hmm. all of those scenes where he's behaving so oddly and almost everyone else they experience has a clear role to play. Which is just be like, oh, you sir are a weird fella. And she has to be like playing on four different levels at the same time, you know? Because you settle into, like, if you're on a road trip like that, like, she's going to get bored of his shtick. Like, she's going to have to fall asleep, and eventually she's just going to treat him like he's part of her background, even though it's a crazy-ass situation that she's in, and she plays that. So there's that, but then there's also this emotionally charged situation of, he looks like my dead husband, this is putting me through a bunch of shit, right? This isn't him. It's reminding me of all these things. And then the third level is, is my life at stake? I'm being kidnapped and Mm -hmm. held hostage at gunpoint. Yeah. And then the guy sitting next to you is going like, ah, oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a very challenging two-hander, you know? And she said, like, I didn't really feel like I was acting with him in a lot of ways because, like, I'm not looking at him for the whole first half of the movie, you know? There's, like, a lack of chemistry by design, you know? You're mm-hmm. not really engaging. He was so in his thing. It was, uh, I didn't really feel like his personality was coming through it. And they must have filmed it to some extent in order because it's a road trip. Like, they have to get from location to location. I don't know how much they did, though. I read that um, uh, Bridges, like, went through the script and came up with levels of modulation and had, like, his script was, like, noted to death in the margin so that he could go back to a scene and be able to chart exactly where he would be in his development. Oh, yeah. Right. He he had to keep track of it because they didn't shoot in sequence, unsurprisingly, because of well, it's all over the fucking place, uh, this movie. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the kind of shit Jeff Bridges does because he's got a crazy heart. Um, and he'll, he'll, <laughs> you know, he'll never. Hey, hell or high uh, water. David. Fall in the door in the floor. I really was really, really struggling. <laughs> David, here. I don't remember why this came up in some recent episode, but we talked about the fact that like none of us could remember what the song was called in Crazy Heart for how big a deal it was and it winning the Oscar and everything. We did that like two episodes ago and I already can't remember what that fucking song is it's, called. It's the weary kind. Right. The weary Even kind. when he's the weary kind, he shows up to set ready to work. Yes. And, you know, I like when he's uh, the weary kind in this. He looks tired at a certain point. And that's the first time you clock like, oh, he is not an alien. He is. He must obey human rules like he's fucking tired. But like the fact that he's not playing it by like, like uh, hunched over coughing like he I just think he avoids every obvious trap of this. And sometimes he goes smaller than you expect. And sometimes he goes bigger than you expect. Like, he takes really big risks in this performance. I also just like lines like, um, I have a great emptiness, or this body has a great emptiness to describe hunger. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm realizing? It's funny that Jeff Bridges is in K-Pax. Mm. Of course, you know, one of the 10 most influential movies ever of made. Course. Yeah. And not something that doesn't exist. Right. In which he plays a guy trying to get inside of the head of a guy who's like, I'm an alien. Like, You're it's not the, an it's alien, sort of like, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it's just weird that's you know that's another thing about bridges talking like versus bacon or douglas or um uh cruise or whatever 
where like Bridges has that voice that almost sounds like it's modulated. Like his voice yeah. was so deep, especially even from later. a young age. Well, right. now it's like absurd. It's crazy. Right. right. But like, even you watch last picture show and you're like, that's like an odd voice to be coming out of a 16 year old, you know? And then he's mm -hmm. got that like sort of folksy drawl on top of it. But it does it, it you know, it, it lends a quiet eeriness, especially in the first chunk when he's saying so little. Yeah. And then when he's like, you know, turning into more of a human, you, you get why people would like go on a car ride with him and be like, yeah, OK, that's a person. I, I believe that. Yeah, I mean, he's also just so fucking handsome. So handsome. He's well, yeah, so David, handsome. you were you were you were telling me that uh, after I was texting you about watching Witness for the first time about Harrison Ford, you were like, Katie hey, likes hunks from the 80s. Then we'll talk about how hot hair is uh, hot, hot Jeff Bridges is. So I feel yeah, um, we should dig into that. That's that's very weird and unique, Katie, that you like the best mm -hmm. looking men ever to be in movies. <laughs> Katie's got this curious taste. Harrison Ford? David, I'm, Bridges? I'm making fun of, I'm making fun of David for texting you as if that's like, huh, no, interesting. It, Oh, no, I like it, there's something about I haven't been born in the 80s. I was born in 84, the year this comes out where you grow up with like the dude. You grow up with Harrison Ford in Air Force One, who's like still a very good looking man. There's something about going back and seeing these people you have grown up with as like grown people and being like, oh, my God, that's what you look like in the mid 80s. Like you you rediscover them, I think, as you get older. Uh, yes. Bridges has Absolutely. had five distinct eras of hot. Let's do it. Let's do it. Break it down. Baby face Bridges in the 70s. You know what I mean? Like last picture show, <laughs> Fat City, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, right? You know, like baby face bridges. Great. A very, a very cute guy. Right. But, so they're, they're he's, two, he's baby two baby face nominations, both of which he's this hot shot, sort of like shitty and grin young kid. Okay. And the, honestly, that last picture show nomination is surprising. You'd think, it's I guess wild. Timothy Bottoms might have campaigned as a lead or something, but like he has a lot more weight, you know, in that movie. And like Jeff Bridges is playing the dopey guy, you know, he's so good. That is the kind of Oscar nomination that used to happen where Hollywood would just be like, well, this person's undeniably a movie star. This is the guy, right? This it's is not like an Oscar-y right. role or performance other than that this guy is on fucking fire. I mean, he also talks about like, that was pre-Oscar campaign, so he just woke up in the morning and was like, what right. happened? Hey, yeah, right. you were and one of the five, knew, yeah. Right, he knew that like that movie was designed to win Ben Johnson an Oscar. And he was just like, no one had even thrown out the possibility that I would get nominated for this fucking thing. Um, yeah. Then you got 80s Bridges, you know, so Cutter's Way, uh, sure. which is, he's so hot. This Jagged Edge. Against All Odds. Right, like, again, you know, um, uh, uh, let's, you know, those movies. Tron is sort of, he's still kind of baby in Tron, but, you know, Tron, I guess. Um, but, you know, so they're just, just grown up, a tra handsome man, Jeffrey. Then we've got 90s Bridges. Right. This is My like personal. dad handsome. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Starting mm -hmm. with Baker Boys. And then you got like Fisher King, yeah. Blown Away, right? Fearless, White mm -hmm. Squall, where his hair is longer. Yeah. Right? Maybe yeah. he's yep. got a little a little beard or something. Playing a couple scumbums in this era. Like sometimes plays a yeah, a more a more conflicted character. Very intense. Takes a lot of intense roles. Then 2000s, we've got you know, well, he skipped Lebowski. Lebowski is kind of the entry to the next phase, right? Where it's like, you know, uh, he's sort of an elder statesman by well, like by this. This point. is the weird thing about Lebowski is like Lebowski comes out, no one gives a shit about it. It's a weird one-off performance for him. It, it was the it was the Coen Brothers follow-up to Fargo, and everyone was like, "What the fuck is this?" He right. goes back to like the previous Bridges mode, like K Pax, Arlington Road, sea fucking biscuit. Contender. Sea Biscuit, yeah. those all sort of fall into what you're talking about. And then around like 2005, everyone's like, oh, Lebowski's the best shit ever. We should have him play that all the time. So now everyone starts asking him to do that. Right. And the other thing is people realize that he is the dude kind of like the right. Coen brothers are like, yeah, yeah. we cast him because that's like what he's like. Like, do you guys not know that about Jeff Bridges? Right. Like, <laughs> and so then you have. Right. Like door in the floor is like sad, dude. Right. Then Thailand yes. is like way too much, dude. Yes, right, right. And then, I mean, is Crazy Heart the beginning of the next phase? I guess it is. Crazy Heart is beginning a marble mouth phase. Iron Man is the end of the last phase. Like Iron Man in, um, and he's playing like Baker and Carter in the same year as Iron Man, which is like a interesting combo. 
Uh, but yeah, Crazy Heart, then like it all like coalesces finally. He made a father-son road trip movie with Justin Timberlake. What's it called? The called... Open Road. Oh, the same year as Crazy Heart. You gotta get on the... I remember this poster. Jeez. Timberlake, one of his worst looks. Yeah. Jesus. And like, yeah, I see that. Yeah, it's bad. They're it's both, like a really in between Both phase. playing baseball players? What is this fucking movie? I don't know. It got released like Labor Day weekend 2009. So like two months before Wild. Crazy Heart. And like when I feel like with Crazy Heart, it's not like anyone had ever given up on Jeff Bridges, right? But it had been a few years since he'd had a successful film, uh, excluding Iron Man, which, you know, was not a Bridges Like vehicle. Iron Man teased it up, right? Like Iron Man, you're like, hey. But there was that thing then, with Crazy yeah. Heart where it was like, clear, that's it. He's winning. Well, you know, he's and not saying, only that, yeah. it was like, that movie was like completely off the radar. It plays at Toronto and it, it doesn't have distribution. And then Fox buys it and they're like, we're putting this in theaters tomorrow. He's going to win the Oscar. Because like, he's up against... Clooney and Up in the Air. Now, Clooney's probably not going to win again, but that's a big performance from a big love actor. Firth and a single man who usually would be walking away with it because that's the right. kind of shit they love, right? right? Morgan Freeman playing Nelson Mandela. Which felt like Jeremy the biggest Renner, slam dunk of all time. Yeah. Right. And then Jeremy <laughs> Renner in The Hurt Locker, which is like sort of like, it's like, well, we, if we're going to give this best picture, how do we not give this guy yeah. best actor? Like he's so much yeah. of the movie. And they're like, no. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. We've we've whiffed on Bridges six times right. already or whatever. Like, we're right. not whiffing again. <laughs> and then he could, he's like, fine, but what if I did two more performances that would make sense as my Oscar? My, like, legacy Oscar. The the other thing is that, like, Crazy Heart, uh, what is it? I mean, True Grit's only a year after Crazy Heart. I just remember, like, when he's on the Crazy Heart Oscar trail being like, He's doing True Grit with the Coen brothers next. Don't you think we should wait a year? Does anyone doubt that's going to be a better performance? Give it to Firth this year, and then instead Firth wins in 2010 for King's Speech. Like, they should have swapped Oscar years. Well, right, but also, like, you know, Jer Jesse Eisenberg should probably be winning that year. But hey, look, uh, sure, there's sure, a lot sure, going sure. on. There's a lot going on. Well, the other thing is, though, it's he's playing a role that had won another guy a legacy Oscar. Right. In True Grit. So yeah. it's like, surely we're not going to do that again, right? But they, they could have like, done it. They yeah, but Crazy Heart could have been is been like Joker. Crazy Heart is like him? Yeah, right. Joker the only... You want to win an Oscar? Play either Joker or Rooster Cogburn. <laughs> right. No, it's, I mean, what? It's it's Joker and Elizabeth II, I think, are the only two characters that, is that different right? actors have won Oscars for playing. Am I wrong about that? You know, I think you might, I mean, I don't know, off the top of my head. I was going to say Vito Corleone, but of course, uh, no, yes, Vito Corleone. Oh, Vito oh, Corleone yeah, right. is the other one. Those right. are the yeah, three. Yeah, yeah. Those are yeah, right. the three. Um, what was I going to say about Bridges? Oh, Crazy Heart's also kind of just him doing Tender Mercies, though. Yeah, it is. And it's a worse version. And I don't really like that movie, although he's good, obviously. Like, he's, yeah, he's, he's undeniably he's good in uh, that. that movie is just, I just remember that movie being kind of annoying it's that it's just one of those movies where you're like looking at your watch like when's he gonna fuck up mm -hmm, like when, mm -hmm. when when's it gonna happen you know like when, when when's the turn coming where he's gonna you know oh he's the when sweetheart she leaves him with do the something kid, stupid. I just was like I don't want to fucking what are you watch doing? this yeah 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 uh, forgotten thing about that Oscar race that like I feel like was too obvious to say at the time but now you don't remember the guy who uh, wrote the song The Re Weary Kind Ryan Bingham who's like in the mu movie as a musician that is the name of George Clooney's character in Up in the Air it's really? so weird it's just so bizarre coincidence and no uh, he he was called Mr. Air so I don't know what you're talking <laughs> he about was, he was <laughs> who is up in Mr. Air is that Vera Farmiga the title actually refers to yeah. her yeah she was all up in his air uh <laughs> It was the titular role. <laughs> um, did you have Oscar facts, Katie? Didn't you said you had Oscar facts about? You're holding the big Oscar book. Yeah, I'm holding the big yeah. Oscar book. Wait, are we are we done talking about Starman? Show? Are we going to jump? No, back but to let's. Just, I don't know. We don't want to forget. Talking. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Never, never forget. Uh, so, never like, forget. so this is the Amadeus year. This is the year where there were three different movies about dust, women in the Dust Bowl who all got nominated. Uh, Sally Field. Who wins her places in the, heart. in the heart? And then I'm gonna mm -hmm. like look through this book and fail to remember. I think Jessica, Jessica Lang was one of them and Sissy Spacek for the river. And Sissy Spacek. It doesn't say much about Jeff Bridges like at all. I kind of see like the the vibe from this book. This the book that I'm holding is called Inside Oscar: The Unofficial History of the Academy Awards by Mason Wiley and Damian Bona, which is really great for just like remembering all of the buzz stuff that is completely easy to forget. Um, so it doesn't talk about Jeff Bridges much. It seems like it was just like there's four people and then Jeff Bridges showed up and hey, everybody likes it's him. 
he, it feels like a a little bit of a surprise nomination though, just because it is a genre thing. It wasn't a huge hit, and then you also look, and he like didn't win critics awards. He won. Yeah. The Saturn Award, he got a Golden Globe nomination and then got the Oscar. Well, and, this, and the person whose spot he took, and Griffin, you might be able to guess this. They were there was like Ooh. a widely expected person who was going to get in for Best Actor, who won New York Film Critics Circle, but didn't get huh. nominated. Uh, 1984. 1984. I know who. It's one. Of, it's know it's who. definitely one of your guys. It's a it's a comic performance. It's it's maybe this guy's best movie performance and rex reed Weird. famously dis famously dissed him after the new york film critic circle uh, Weird. uh one. i'm getting caught up on i know in 88 new york film critics gives best actor to keaton for beetlejuice and clean and sober which is one of my pretty favorite cool. things ever pretty cool so i'm trying to think like who's 84, another comedian comedic right. actor that you love uh it's is it a steve martin performance the steve martin performance yes uh, is is it? Uh, uh, I'm getting my years wrong here. It's not Roxanne, is it? Nope. No. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Nope. What's his per performance? Like a movie where he's really giving a performance, the comic, but like it's like kind of a big performance. All of me. All of me. All of me. Cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool, right? Cool. Like, and he I, got the Globe yeah. nom, so he was definitely you know in there. Yeah. Interesting. I don't love that movie, but that's sort of like an undeniable skill piece. Right. Yeah. It's, it, that's the thing. It's just he's acting like, you know, it, you know, you know, but the nominees are the two Amadeus guys, mm -hmm. Abraham. Right, and right, right. Albert Finney and Under the Volcano, which is that where at this point, at, which, a great performance. And at this point, it's like every time they're passing on a legend. Right. You know, right. He's, right. you know, and they pass again. Like, yeah. And, and, yeah. and then he passed and away. So, he did. It's true. I mean, many years later. And Sam Waterston in The Killing Fields, which is actually like not a particularly good performance, but it, it's fine. And I guess it was just sort that, of it like, was, he was you so know, big, was big and deal. everyone thought he was going to be like the next serious leading man. He had such like fucking public he's, he's, theater bona fides. Right. right, exactly. And so it's sort of a, eh, you know. Eh. And so, yeah, it does feel like Bridges kind of snuck in there, even though when you look at these five actors, the only guy who's more of a titan than Bridges is Finney. Like, yeah, right. you know, not, no offense to F. Murray Abraham and Tom Halsey. And, offense taken. Uh, Sam Waters, who I love. Well, I love them all. The, just to go back to Steve Martin for a second, so at the New York Film Critics Circle Awards, uh, he comes up and uh, accepts his award. He says, so Rex Reed had written his column. I'm still in shock over that one about Steve Martin winning. And so then Steve Martin shows about the awards. He says, it is a great honor to have been given this award by so many distinguished critics and Rex Reed. Hell cool. yeah. Cool. Take that, Rex. Way harsh. Yeah. Um, so at these Oscars themselves, uh, the big scandal that I was kind of astonished by is that Amy Irving was going to present and she is pregnant uh, and has been is with Steven Spielberg, but they're not married. And there was a bunch of discussion backstage over whether or not an unwed uh, pregnant woman should be allowed to present at the Oscars. Wow. So Fuck that. that was that that is wild. Wild. in 1985. In 1985. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is also the Oscars where Prince uh, shows up at the red carpet with 20 uniformed escorts on motorcycles around his purple limousine that the paint was still wet on. And he wore Good. a uh, purple hood, sequin hood and cape. <laughs> Um, and then uh, wins best picture. I uh, wins best uh, song, wins best song score, yeah, best song and yeah, yeah best song, song score. Yeah. I think he won both. Yeah. Um, and then the oh, no, he didn't win best song. He lost, but he wasn't even nominated for best song. Weird. Anyway, carry on. Uh, the last thing I was going to say at the after party is that Jeff Bridges' mother made her way over to one of her son's former co-stars, Sam Waterston, to tell him we rooted for Jeff, but we rooted for you too. I just thought that was nice. He brought That's he brought his parents to the Oscars. Yeah, that is nice. Um, yeah, this this seemed like a wild Oscars, honestly. It's it's just funny because when you look, it's one of those things where you look at the Golden Globes and they nominated all five. Their their actor in a drama nomination is the same as the Oscar. Mm -hmm. But then in comedy, you have Martin in All of Me, you have Bill Murray in Ghostbusters, you have Eddie Murphy in Beverly Hills Cop. Wow. You have these like titanic comic yeah. performances that are all deserving of Oscar attention. You've also got Robin Williams in Moscow on the Hudson, which is, you know, a broad performance. <laughs> Playing Yakov Smirnoff. I mean, Yakov Smirnoff is like shit on that performance for years being like, he stole my bit. <laughs> and then they all lost to fucking Dudley Moore in some Blake Edwards piece of shit <laughs> called Mickey and Maude. Are you kidding me? <laughs> which like, isn't that insane? 
<laughs> like the globes where you're like, eh, the globes kind of got it right. And they're like, no, 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 shut up, shut up. Dudley Moore <laughs> to the stage. Not only that, it's like Time to win your sixth globe. I, I, know, I know Dudley Moore had a real hot run there, but you're like talking about arguably the, the two, like four biggest male comedy stars of the last 25 yeah. years, right? It's like, it's like, though, yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly of the 80s, like, if that yeah, is. No, Mar Martin, Williams, Murphy, and, and, <laughs> and Murray. Murray. I heard it. And Murray. Bill yeah, come fucking on. Murray in Ghostbusters. Yeah. <laughs> in Ghostbusters. He busted it, ghosts. It's also. Did that count for nothing? <laughs> for nothing. He wasn't afraid of them. It's also just absurd that, like, Beverly Hills Cop gets a best screenplay Oscar nomination, and it's like, Eddie Murphy wrote that whole movie. Yeah. Like, you yeah, should give right. him a Best Actor nomination if you like that film. He just made it up. It's just, it's just funny to look back. Um, but, Dudley, uh, Dudley Moore. Star Man. Star Man. Are there Star Man scenes? We want the diner scene is so big diner for me. So we big. talked about that. What, what else? I, so, in the, in the cops who were chasing uh, them down from the motel, did you guys uh, recognize who we're looking at? No. So uh, Dirk Locker, who plays uh, Hitchcock on mm -hmm. Brooklyn oh. Nine-Nine, uh, looks exactly the same. Just exactly yep. the same in this movie as he does in Brooklyn I recognize the other guy. It's MC Ganey. It's Ganey, Ganey. It's, uh, yeah. It's wow. Mr. Beard from Lost. I mean, yep. he's in lots of things, obviously. Um, uh, you famously see his penis in sideways <laughs> classic moment. Uh, that was not what I was thinking of, but that. That's, um, that's what I oh, was thinking. And of. then I, um, I finally found the notes that I was talking about before we started recording. And I'm not trying to diss this or anybody else by saying this, but there's like a proto Forrest Gump vibe in this performance in the hat and in the check shirt and in the strange speaking and in the man who is not quite a person. There's there's some link between those two there. Yes. Yes. I mean, look, it, it is it is a very fine line. He's walking. Right. Yeah. Because it, it can very easily read as like cognitively impaired. And and you also don't want scenes of everyone treating him like he's a child. It's why it's crucial, right, that, again, he is not exactly an innocent. Like, because if he was, then again, it would be like, oh, he has the mind and the spirit of a, of a child. And yeah. We must look at Earth through a child's eyes or, or whatever. You know what I mean? And it's not quite that. I mean, look, he's, we're, he's we're curious about yeah. like what a good actor he is and what a sort of hardworking actor he is and all the things he contributed to this performance. But when you talk about just like, you know, fundamental qualities that help a performance like casting, you know, things that you can't sort of uh, manufacture, it does help that he's got an old man's eyes. Hmm. Like even when you watch Last Picture Show. There is that weird thing where even at his like most youthful and as you said, sort of like baby face, he's got like somewhat weary eyes. He's the weary kind. He's yes. the weary kind. BK beat me to it. He ain't no place for the weary <laughs> kind. I don't remember the lyrics to that song. What else? He there's the, I do like I do like him walking out of the fire with the weird force field. Yeah, that shot that's on the uh, DVD cover. There's some really great dad jokes. Like there's, you know, some dad energy in this movie. And the one I love is the gas station where ZZ Top, one of the band members, shows up in a cameo and he says something about her, be, her you know, be, her character being the women's restroom and he goes, gas. And he goes, yeah, I get it. You know, that's which ZZ, is a subtle that's fart joke. That's someone in ZZ Top? Mm -hmm. Wow. I did not know that. And I love ZZ It's Billy Pop. Gibbons or whatever. It's B that Billy Gibbons? Mm -hmm. Wow. It's incredible. We love it. We love Billy Gibbons. We love ZZ Top. Ben once made fun of me for liking ZZ Top, but he's wrong. Okay. Well, we'll leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> the yellow light joke uh, where he almost, the, the hay truck flips over and he's like, I was paying very close attention to you. Red is stop. Green is go. Yellow is drive faster. Yep. Like <laughs> some great fucking stuff, man. There's you know, some good really stuff. Really yeah. quiet. Yes. Like, cause like if it was too jokey, like you guys were saying, you would get, you would really lose like, you know, the emotional attachment you're building with the character. But that stuff plays really well. Also, a lot of hay in this movie. A lot of hay. Now I'm realizing the two different yeah. hay sequences. 
Yeah. I also think this movie threads the needle really well in terms of the logic of, uh, obviously, like, he's an advanced being. He can learn very quickly, right? But filling in the gaps of, like, what he understands and what he doesn't understand, where it's like, they don't speed things up too much where it becomes unnatural, but it's also not just frustrating where you're 45 minutes in and it's like, you still don't understand, like, prepositions? <laughs> Come on, you know, like... <laughs> But they always find even the smoking kind of comes later in the movie. Yeah. Where he smokes a cig and just like, like, yeah. I mean, you were expecting it to happen again. Like it kind of plays like just like a quiet, funny moment where he just has like a coughing fit afterwards. Such a good coughing fit. He plays that beautifully. Yeah. Like generally surprised. Like what is happening to my body? <laughs> uh, I don't mean this as uh, like a full criticism and I hope it doesn't come out as such but i want i want to uh throw a topic out in the table for discussion i don't know if it's the performance or the writing of the character but the charles martin smith role is always hits me a little strange i always feel like i can't totally figure out what they're going for with this this guy. is the scientist who decides that he wants to help he's him in the, the main end. yes yeah. yes he's the the more benevolent of the chasers essentially i you know and I like Charles Martin Smith. I do too. You know, I do too. American Graffiti, obviously. We 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 enjoy, you know, the Untouchables. I mean, yes, he, he was the most touchable of the Untouchables, and then becomes like America's preeminent animal director. He does Air Bud and the Dolphin Tail movies. Wow, this is almost a uh, almost as good a transition as Dinky. Oh my God, Dinky Dave, Dinky, Dinky, Dinky Dean, Dinky Dean. Um, Dean. Yeah, this also, this is the stuff that you, you remember that movie Midnight Special, which like, what, what yeah, what's up yes. with Jeff Nichols? What's he doing now? Isn't he making like a Quiet Place movie or something? But uh, like, and everyone was like, oh, this movie's so Spielberg-y. And I'm really, I'm like, God, it's that very movie Starman. is so Starman. Yes. And the Adam Driver role is sort of the, uh -huh. right, like the, the sort of benevolent government agent role works a lot better in that movie. Yes, because I think with Driver, A, you're, you're playing that tension of, is this guy a menace or is he on the right side? You know, there, there's that, uh, I, I don't know, there's that juice to it. And I think you buy both sides of it from him. And with Charles Martin Smith, it feels like they can't pick which type of guy he is. Because it's sort of like, oh, he's like Ernest Dork, but then he's also kind of an asshole. There's the cigar thing which is bizarre. Like sometimes he's big dogging people and other times he's like very like, come on, it's science. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I, I like him a lot. And I always feel like I like th the role this character plays in the movie. I've seen this movie, I guess this was maybe my third time. And I always think like, oh, I'm going to get his performance this time. I'm going to figure it out. And I just kind of can't get my head around this guy. The movie kind of just sort of slows down on those scenes. Like, I really just kind of want to be with them. Like, I don't, I just don't care as much about that stuff. So, yeah. But as you said, in relation, when Midnight Special cuts to Adam Driver, you're on the edge of your seat. You're like, what the fuck's going on here? Well, Adam Driver is America's favorite big weirdo. So, you know, that's a yeah. good point. The, the scene he has with them, though, in that, like, round, uh, like, Navajo, uh, diner i guess basically is really good though like when he, when he finally gets to them it's like it's like it was worth the time to spend with him sort of to have like the sheer wonder in his eyes when jeff bridges starts talking uh yeah i just kind of i guess wish he had picked a lane earlier than yeah. that it, it's worth it but i just feel like the character feels a little unfocused to me i also just want to uh fill in because i was trying to remember of course the other thing that jeff nichols has been working on recently david uh five episodes of the scripted children's podcast Hank the Cow Dog, of course, starring Matthew McConaughey as Hank the Cow Dog. I'm subscribing right now. Hank the Cow Dog. We love uh, it. Kirsten Dunst as Sally Mae. Jesse Plemons as Drover. Joel Edgerton as Rip. Michael Shannon as Sinister. What? Cynthia Erivo as Madame Moonshine. Leslie Jordan as Pete the Barn Cat. What is this? Is this like a fucking, you know, some kind of weird shell thing like it's like they're moving money through this podcast check out the link in the episode notes uh Absolutely. like subscribe yeah uh, uh... Hank, Hank the cow dog the self-declared head of ranch security finds himself smack dab in the middle of a host of tangled mysteries and capers that span the universe of the texas panhandle cattle ranch 
that Hank calls home. Well, I'm sold. Well, you, you might be interested in hearing that Hank has joined on these tail wagging tons. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no right. I have. David, I won't read the whole thing, but I have to get this one sentence out. Hank is joined on these tail wagging, tongue slobbering adventures by a motley <laughs> assemblage of characters, not leech of which is the less than trusty sidekick Drover, a small but uncourageous mutt. Wow. You know how we were talking about new Zoom features before? Uh -huh. I wish there was yeah. a Zoom feature where prison bars just came down on Griffin's screen. <laughs> <laughs> and it Lock was like, locked in. <laughs> <laughs> I've subscribed. I have pulled it up. I subscribed. I'm going to report back. Okay. Okay. Find out what Jeff's been up to. I um, hope uh, Charlie uh, next week is doing a uh, Hank the Cow Dog <laughs> recap podcast. <laughs> We're going to make millions on this. The only big thing we haven't talked about is just that, yeah, that he gives her a baby and then he leaves. Well, the, right? end, like, the just, ending. Just, we yeah. we got to talk about the yeah. ending. It's the ending's lovely. incredible. Uh, the Behringer crater is so cool, obviously. He's got this great line, I think, right before they get to the crater that I wrote down, just in terms of like, talking about his language, where he just says, I will miss the cooks and the singing and the dancing and the eating. Which is just such a good like that's that's planet Earth right there, right? And then and yeah. then she like looks at him and he says like and the other things. Yeah. Like oh, she yeah. gives him oh, the look know. of like where he's coming from. Remember we we fucking joined the the ten inch high club or whatever <laughs> the, the 12, fuck Ben 12 called feet it. High club. Twelve, 12 foot, inch. Ben 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 twelve foot, sorry. <laughs> uh um the way I, I yeah, just his whole thing like you know there's the, again the easier way of doing the aliens like you know you are a primitive species but you know you only you understand love he doesn't ever say anything like that right but i do like the way he talks about his civilization where he's like look we've nailed it obviously we live in this like utopian civilization we're very smart and every you know but like we are kind of missing something i do kind of like the you know dutch the danger pie. of this place yeah and that's yeah. the dutch apple pie yeah, the, then just the whole like the like red lighting that David you have as your zoom background and like the intensity of that ending and how he disappears and it's just her face that gives you the special effect of seeing yeah. whatever it's like when he goes up. It's really beautiful. What a freckle face! She's what got. a face! We what a freckle face! That freckle she's kind of one of the ultimate freckle faces in in cinema history. Oh, for sure. Freckle face. Yes. Yeah. Um. Love Karen Allen. I think she's my winner this year. Let me see. I think she's my, Interesting. Actress, my actress winner. Yeah. Well, weren't you guys talking on something else in the Carpenter series about ending on a face, about Carpenter liking to end on a close-up of somebody's face? Because this one definitely does. It, I felt like it, it jogged memory. And made it, <laughs> yeah, I already forget it, but I think that is the case. I mean, I, yeah, you know. she's my winner. Yeah. It's, look, it's a fucking uh, incredible performance. Uh, do you folks know about the uh, Starman TV show? Yeah, okay, so we have to talk about it for a second. For a second. Just for a second. Just because the concept of it is so The concept bizarre. is insane. It's now, insane. here's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. The concept's logical, of course, because this movie does end with him giving her one of his little silver balls and being like, my son will know what to do with it. I gave you a so, baby, okay. man. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But this show, which aired in 1986, just two years later, is set 15 years in the future. Because it's about his son. We don't want it to be about a toddler. It's a 15 years in the future. S Starman comes back to Earth. Karen Allen is missing. He and his son have to go on the run to find the missing It's mom. like the Incredible Hulk. Like right. every episode, they're in some new town. And Starman is going to be weird. And, and the Star son's going to be like, Dad, you have to figure it out. And then they'll do some magic shit. Robert Hayes of Airplane plays Starman. And I'm forgetting the actor's name now, but the actor who plays Star Boy is Christopher, Dan Christopher Daniel Barnes, who is, is Prince Eric. Is Prince Eric and also is uh, Greg Brady in the Brady Bunch movie. Wow. That's right, he is. Right. We talked about him on the Little Mermaid episode. And so he's not pretending to be Jeff Bridges' character. He's like, come back. Starman has come back in a different human body, is the idea. No, he's, he's, no, he's the no, same. No, he's, oh, he's, he's, he's supposed guy. to be the same. He's the same guy. You know, back then, they didn't fucking give a shit. They were just like, he's Jeff Bridges. Yeah, whatever. Who cares? It Get is wild. It. Like, I, because I feel like I know, now... I know that in the season finale, they find the mom, they find Jenny. 
And then I think whatever ABC was like enough of this and they canceled it. I I, I don't know where it was going to go. Right. Like how much more could there be? It just played on the fucking sci-fi channel for a decade. Uh, like, oh, fuck. I was hoping it would be a Star Trek rerun and it's Star Man. <laughs> <laughs> Lame. That sucked ass. It's, it's, it's just like, uh, yes, okay, he does sort of set up a future there at the end of the movie. This is not a movie that screams TV spin-off. No, no, no but, but it is bizarre. Like, because now, you know, every time there's some new deadline headline about like some overqualified person is going to adapt some movie as a prestige streaming show or whatever. And you're like, come the fuck on. And then you look at TV in the 80s and 70s and the amount of TV, sh- uh, TV shows that were based off of middle, middle successful movies. Right. That movies just that did okay yeah, a couple right. years ago. Right. right. And, and it's just, and then network TV is like, okay, but how can it be like about a mystery of the week or whatever, right? Like how can it be like the most procedural shit possible? Yeah. Right. But then also like the amount of like beloved movies that became like real boilerplate sitcoms. It's, it's just bizarre, you know? Yeah. Guys, remember John from Cincinnati? Yeah. Of great course. Show. Yeah. Hey, owes a lot to this. How so? He comes and visits, and he's mysterious, and he's weird, and he solves okay, everybody's okay, problems. Okay, okay, and, okay. And, and, well, and also anything that's said to him, he just replies, I don't know Dickie instead. There's the, the first episode, all he says is, I don't know Dickie instead, like, you know, because that's what someone said to him. I love John from Cincinnati. Wow. Because, I mean, you know, the con- John from Cincinnati, the first six episodes, he's just parroting dialogue that everyone else says around him. And then this incredible sixth episode, he brings all the characters together and mirrors all this dialogue at them and helps them realize all these emotional truths. And you're like, this show is fucking incredible. And then it kind of just keeps going. And you're sort of like, I don't know. I think they might have, they should have just kind of ended it there. Like they kind of just had something there. And then it's like, what is still about weird surfers and like a levitating alien guy. I don't, you know, like it doesn't have anything anywhere more to go. It missed the limited series. Such, boom. A, cool, such a cool thing. It, yes, yeah, it absolutely. Do you remember when we threatened that that was going to be like our third mini series that we were like, we're going to do Shyamalan the Wachowskis and then just do episode by episode John from Cincinnati. I, it was my, because it is such a blank check that D- David Milch was like, HBO fucks me around too much on Deadwood. I'm going to cancel Deadwood and do this surfer alien show. It's going to air out of the Sopranos finale that just like shattered America. They're going to be like, uh, anyway, and now here's John from Cincinnati. <laughs> like, you know, that's that was its first episode. It is such a blank check thing. It's so cool. Cast that show is so fucking wild, too. It's it's loaded out yeah. of control. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Good show. Uh, I learned from Wikipedia that in 2016, Sean Levy was planning to uh, direct and produce a remake of Starman. Correct. Michael uh, Douglas was on board. Kind of amazing. No one has remade Starman, actually. Yeah. It is well, kind of just look, sitting there. Levy seems like the exact guy who would want to jump on that, and I hope it never happens. Uh, it's been five years, and there doesn't seem to be another word on it, so I'm not too worried. I'm checking to see if it's on his IMDb still. Not well, in America has pre guy fever. I mean, he's never going to make a movie does. that doesn't have Ryan Reynolds in it again. I mean, America loves free guy. Let's play, speaking of free guy fever, the box office game for Starman, Griffin. This film came out. December 14th, 1984. Yeah. It opened number six. It's mm-hmm. not in the top five. No. I, fo- I found some uh, quote from a uh, piece about uh, the holiday season box office in 84, projecting what they thought the big hits of the season would be. Mm-hmm. And there was a quote that was just stunning that was like, Columbia's hoping for at least a five million opening for Starman which would bode well for the movie's chances to join the hundred million dollar club. Isn't that, is it, it was a different world back then, right? Right. You're just like, if a movie can open with five million in December on like a thousand screens, then you might leg it out to a hundred million dollars 11 months later. <laughs> exactly. but, th- but they thought but, this was going to be a huge, huge hit, and it did okay. It did okay. It made $28, $29 million, like it, but it very much. Like, you know, did okay. Were they right to think it was, was going to be a huge hit? Like, movies were different in the 80s. But this, like, this doesn't scream next E.T. to me. I This is the thing. I think when you describe the basic premise of this movie, and we were joking about, like, how bizarre all the poster tagline and images are, but there is, like, a very clean pitch for this movie that sounds like such 
a fucking emotionally potent thing where it's just like uh, an alien lands on Earth and takes the body of a woman's dead husband. Right. Yeah. You're just like, fuck, I could see that movie being emotionally devastating in like a very accessible way. Uh, and it's like fantasy and it's romance and it's sci fi, it's adventure and like all this sort of shit. And I think, you know, one of the reasons this film has, uh, uh, you know, lasted well, and I think all of Carpenter's can and his age particularly well, is that he is an aggressively unsentimental filmmaker mm -hmm. who is not caught up in the trends of the time. And I think he didn't make the version of this movie that would have been a colossal sort of like officer and a gentleman style, like romance hit, you know, but. He he gets his just desserts decades later when people still love his movies. Yeah, I I think he made a movie with uh, that's a lot more interested in the sort of bottled emotions and that lack of like huge catharsis. Mm -hmm. uh, probably cost it tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, this movie doesn't have like these sort of holy shit sequences. May his his birth you know aside that would have audiences whatever like buzzing and wanting more i don't know it's such a good movie though so yeah, whatever. yeah rules, you know, rules like you said carpenter gets to eat out but this is number six okay number one griffin it's a huge hit we just mentioned it it's a comedy it's helping to launch a superstar uh I guess he's pretty at this point beverly hills cop i'd say this is the superstar moment this is when he's gone this from being a right, star to a right. superstar yeah exactly. he yeah. is so good in that good movie. Uh, the highest grossing film of that year? I think Ghostbusters is the highest grossing. I always forget which was one and which was two because they were the, the tops. It's Ghostbusters. Uh, I do think it's Ghostbusters. It's Ghostbusters. But maybe it's Beverly, Beverly Hills Cop is seven worldwide according to uh, uh, Box Office Mojo. Oh, no, sorry. No, it's it's cal Ugh, it's doing that thing where it's like calendar. It's like Box what Office Mojo is terrible. Yeah, it is terrible. Sorry. Beverly Hills Cop is number one. Defund box office mojo cannot be reformed at this point. If Beverly Hills Cop was down was down the list because it opened in December, which is a right. bullshit metric. Yes, sorry, right. I fixed yeah, it. Right, that's it was number cool. one. Ugh. Cool, it was number one. It's they're very close. Those two. Yeah. Uh, Ghostbusters is still in the box office in its twenty eighth week. Um, Wild number two. Insane. Number two is a massive, famous failure, famous blank check. Hmm. Has nothing to do with a massive sci-fi movie that's coming out this year um pretty much Dune. you know do it's david lynch's Dune, opening at number two to six million dollars a huge disappointment yeah they thought it was um, gonna be the star wars they were ready they like yeah. lynch was writing the sequel like yeah. they were ready to keep going and they had fucking coloring books on shelves and all the shit like they were just they were all ready yep dune number two uh, so could not dethrone Beverly Hills Cop. Number three is a buddy cop movie. Okay. Uh, sorry, buddy crime movie. These guys are, 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 are crimeys. Okay. Or one of them is. I don't know. Um, two huge actors. I guess by the eighties they're but they're huge. huge is movies. is this the Clint Burt Reynolds movie? It is. Uh, what What's this it thing is fucking called? I always get this confused with it's the fortune. Directed by Richard Benjamin. It's it's right. That's a fair confusion. Because the fortune. Because they're both like period pieces. The fortune right? is is Mike Nichols though, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, and that's yeah. Nicholson and Beatty. Yeah. Okay, and this is uh, fuck. Uh, uh, is it? Uh, what's it called? It's called City Heat. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Like, this poster looks pretty good. They're it in does. raincoats. They got guns. And they were old friends. Do it's it. nice that they finally did a movie together. Uh, never seen it. It was not a huge um, hit by you, any means. You, you folks yeah. know the incredible story of, like, uh, Eastwood and Reynolds going in for, like, the general meeting or the screen test at the studio, right? No. So they're like they're like buddies and they came up together and like their careers were very uh, parallel for a while until they went off in obviously very different directions. They go in for a meeting with some like studio executive or screen test or whatever where they're, you know, in that era where they're just like, if you're a man and your shoulders are broad enough and you're handsome enough, we'll just give you a 10 picture deal. We'll figure out where to put you later. Right. Mm. And the two of them walk in and this guy just like rips them both to shreds. And he's just like, I mean, you're miserable. There's nothing here. Reynolds, you can't act. You have no charisma. You cannot deliver lines. You have no integrity or intelligence on screen. You're like a limp fish. 
Eastwood, you're like the weirdest looking guy I've ever seen. Like you can't <laughs> open your eyes and you have this horrible Adam's apple and like all this shit. Can't talk above a whisper, all this stuff. And they walk out and like Reynolds has this big shit eating grin on his face. And Eastwood's like, why are you laughing? That guy just like ripped both of us to shreds. And Reynolds is like, yeah, but I can learn how to act. <laughs> what are you going to do with that fucking Adam's apple? <laughs> I did not know that story. It's a great story. <laughs> He's like, that's fine. I'll go to some classes or something. <laughs> yeah, some, someone teaches acting yeah. around here. Yeah, I'm handsome. <laughs> Number four at the box office is another sequel. Why am I saying another sequel? It's, but it's a sequel. It's a sequel. Uh, one of the strangest sequels to ever exist. It is a oh. sequel to a canonical okay. masterpiece. Yes. Um, it is coming 16 years later. Is it the Sting 2? No. Um, it's Canonical not Masterpiece. Oh, oh, oh. One of the five best films ever made if you'd like fucking did a family feud of film critics or whatever. Why am I not thinking? It's not the two Jakes. No. Uh, is it a sequel that does not retain the stars of the first movie? It sure doesn't. Although I believe... I believe one of the stars does a little a little cameo. Um, no, it's different director, different stars. It's a space movie. It's a 2010? 2010, the year we make contact. Directed Wait, by Peter Hyams. How many years later fame. did you say? 16 years oh, later, right? I heard six. That's why I wasn't guessing it. Oh, well, 16. Um, yep, yeah, 2010. Yeah, bizarre, bizarre they movie. Just, they were like, you know what? Let's do a sequel to that movie that definitely is not setting up a sequel. Right, and also, I, I don't think we need to bring Kubrick back, right? He wasn't the key to success on that one. <laughs> right. Yeah, what did he really have to offer? Um, not a bad movie. I've seen it. It's fun. Peter Himes. Peter Himes, another person who almost directed Starman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, number five at the box office. This is a, a box office of flops. Like, you got Beverly Hills Cop on top, Yeah. but then all these weird fucking movies this is a huge epic movie from one of the most famous directors alive. It's a massive blank check for him. It's a giant bomb. Is it? Uh, it's a vintage Once Upon a Time in uh, America crime drama. No, no. Um, it's one of those movies that this direct this director is still kicking around. He actually had some news about him today, and he, uh, you know, Cotton Club uh, has re-edited it. Yes, it's the Cotton Club. Coppola. It played New York Film Festival like two years ago, right? The, on, like, the, the encore, like the big re-edit. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah, right. yeah. Right. Uh, God, fucking that, uh, that megalopolis news. It's, I, I'm all for it. It's the long game. He's like, yeah, you thought I sold out selling wine 20 years ago. It was all to make my movie. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I'm cashing in. Yeah. And I just I'm love him selling being the like, vineyards. look, I built this fucking vineyard. It's worth a hundred million dollars. I'm going to die. I'll just sell it and make my fucking utopia movie and hope the kids listen. I'm all for it. But Francis. Do it right now. Right You're now. Not a young man. <laughs> Time is of the <laughs> You essence. gotta go. Is it yeah. a blank check if it's your own money? Does that count? Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. 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 I mean, and to be clear, his quote was like, I'm hoping I'll get the financing together. If I can't get all the money together, I'll match it and put up half of the money. If no one gives me any money, I'll just pay for the whole fucking thing. I don't give a shit. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> That's terrible say, negotiation. Don't, exactly. Don't say that in public. <laughs> I heard you could just do it on wine alone. Why am I giving you any money? <laughs> uh, oh, boy. It, I'm so amped. It's like the best news I've heard in so long. It really is. It really is. It um, really is. And it makes him going back and re-editing like everything over the last 10 years make more sense where it's just like, I'm going to put all of that to bed. I'm going to make my final fucking movie and then like drop a wine bottle on the floor and peace out. <laughs> and say Rosebud and that's it. It's true. Yeah. Oh, uh, boy. Starman. We're done. We're done. We gotta We're, be done. Done. We're done. So, We're done. No, We're done. We're done. It's over. There's one person that we forgot to shout out. Okay. Okay. The original Starman. <laughs> so Ben. Here he is. He changed his background to David Bowie. I've had that song He's stuck a in star my head. Star man, for... waiting in the sky. Yeah, ever since you guys asked me to do this, I've had that song stuck in my head. I know, me too. 
it's which that song is what it's like the early 70s that song's been around yeah, for, yeah. yeah i guess there's yeah. there yeah. Yeah. Well, do you think yeah. they had to talk to david bowie before they called this movie Starman? i don't know david bowie would have been a good star man he seems like well, an alien well, he, he already, already did done, his alien yeah movie. manta fell to earth yeah yeah oh fuck have you seen that movie ben very ben movie very ben i don't movie. know i don't know i don't know no, you probably haven't seen it. It's, yeah, you, you would if remember, you remember if you'd you, seen it. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty okay. memorable. It's yeah. good. You'd like it. Yeah. All right. Putting it on the list. <laughs> Putting it on the list. <laughs> Part of me was waiting for it to like the Starman song to be in the credits. I guess it's not really that kind of movie, but I was like, but it's just right there. It's. It would be funny, though, if it's just like this emotional ending and it's like, all right, crank the guitar. <laughs> is a Starman <laughs> waiting in the sky. <laughs> Isn't it in a Martian though? That's where it shows up eventually. Uh, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The Martian had all the what was it? Abba or it had like right? He's always listening to disco it's or all something. Disco. Like, what was I your question, like he, Katie? Yeah. I feel like the Martian uses um um. God, man, I feel like it uses two David Bowie songs. It uses Starman and like another one, or like uses can't use Rocket Ground Man too. Control can it? To yeah, that's. Tom. I'm only seeing Starman listed here, but it says the soundtrack includes, and it's not. Let's. I don't know. I, look, I don't know. I don't know. I can't figure this out right is, now. Is the end <laughs> credit song for The Martian, I Will Survive? It, it should be. It could be. What a it great has, movie. It has some joke, like, needle drop over the end credits that I'm forgetting, and I think that's what it is. Uh, this article from Billboard that. says I Will Survive is on the soundtrack, as is Abba's Waterloo, uh -huh. as is uh, Donna Summer's Hot Stuff. So yeah, more disco than I was remembering. It's because the whole point is that it, he remember it's like that one of the people liked disco, right? And it's all he can listen to, and he's yeah. like, ah, damn it, Sebastian Stan, you love disco or you know whatever person. Yeah. One of the one of the characters. Remembering Sebastian Stan was in the Martian. Laughs. That's a big. That's a good pull. That's a great pull. It's uh yeah Sebastian Stan. He's in that movie. It's Jessica Chastain's character who loves disco apparently. Uh, great movie, great comedy. As Ben pointed out, winner of the Golden Globe for best <laughs> so comedy. So funny. Uh, yep, so funny. It is funny movie. It's a good movie. It's directed by Ridley Scott, who's a nice yeah, man. And I, I like the jokes and the comedy in it. Rid Ridley Scott, <laughs> who in this in in his Wikipedia picture. Uh, looks like someone like an angry person that like Grover is waiting on in Sesame Street. <laughs> and I'm going to send a picture now. <laughs> look at him. Look at this. Just look at this. David, that... look, look on the link. I put it in the chat. <laughs> David, that joke was such fucking grift bait. <laughs> it was. It was a real good but Look at him. <laughs> look at him. He's such a grouch. <laughs> All right. That's the face of a man who is not getting COVID. He's going to say, fuck you. Moving on. <laughs> No, not gonna do it. Not gonna do it. <laughs> Katie, you're the best. It's always a pleasure. What a delight, you guys. Oh, Katie. Thanks for listening to me for the last year as I became a father and was very anxious about oh, it. Oh, it's been so fun. I mean, I feel like as I speak for everyone who knows you, which is that this has been long in the works and you as a father is is perfect. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. You can't use that kind of language around your daughter. <laughs> yeah, she, she wants She's not going to repeat you yet, but she'll start. All right. Uh, listen to Little Gold Man. Read everything oh, yeah. that Katie writes. Oh, wait. No, and uh, every time David Ehrlich's on the show, he doesn't mention Fighting in the War Room, the podcast I do right. with him. Uh, and I give him shit about it. So Fighting in the War Room. Subscribe fighting to that, room. too. Yeah. We've been around for like, a, this is our 10th year, which is bananas. So if you think, if, if people like Blank Check for its longevity... Come, come find us. We've been around even longer. If they, if they like Blank Check, but wish I'd been going on for three years more, then uh, Fighting in the War Room gets my highest recommendation. God, talk about time warps. The fact that seven years of Blank Check, is that what you're telling me? Uh, uh, coming, uh, coming up. Coming up. Coming up. No, no, six, six years coming up, right? This is our I sixth year. This is our yeah, sixth right, year. Right. March right, will seven be years coming up. seven. It yeah, well, you flips know. me out. It does flip me out. It's a great month to have like an anniversary. Good things March. happen in March. Yeah, I love March. He loves March. Is there a Folks, joke I'm not March. getting here, or do you just love I March? Don't know. COVID I don't started. Know. Oh, well, okay. 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 Enough. 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 Of this. Enough. <laughs> Thank you all for <laughs> listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thanks to Marie Barty for her social media and hopefully posting the picture of the cursed Starman baby prop. <laughs> Thank you to Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our, our artwork. Lane Montgomery, The Great American Novel, 
for our theme song, you should check out their new album. Uh, yes, absolutely. Their new album. Uh, our good friends. Thank you to JJ Birch and Nick Loriano for our research. Uh, I am losing my place in the chronology, but next week we have Big Trouble in Little China. That's right. Big movie. Big movie. Big great episode. Guess. Mm-hmm. Big episode. Great guest. Great guest. We won't announce them yet, but great guest. Guests. Plural. Um, and go to uh, patreon.com slash blank check for some mummy commentaries. Get wrapped up in the mummy. Fra- Fraser, Stan Fraser. That's what the kids like these days, right? Brendan yep. Fraser. Stan- Everyone loves Brandon Fraser. Stan a legend. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, blankies.com for some real nerdy uh, shit. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I have to say. Okay? And as always... Listen in as Hank the cow dog always claims to know the answer, is the last to realize he doesn't, but is the first to run headlong into tales of courage, loyalty, and friendship. David, did you realize that there's a sandwich in this movie that has paprika on it? Fuck you. Fuck you. Take a look at me now. I'm Jeff Bridges, I'm hot.